Good morning and welcome. I'm Scott Winship, Director of the Center on Opportunity and Social Mobility here at AEI. Um, let me start with the good news this morning. Uh, in the United States, poverty, in the economic sense of having enough money to afford an adequate standard of living, is at an all-time low. According to careful research co-authored by my AEI colleagues Kevin Corinth and Richard Burkhauser, hardship in the U.S. is down 90 percent uh, from the time that President Lyndon Johnson declared war on poverty. This progress reflects the strength and dynamism of the American economy, as well as a safety net that has expanded while becoming better at encouraging independence. While we should never be content that poverty has become sufficiently rare, this is good news indeed. However, at the same time that economic poverty has plummeted, what we might call social poverty has dramatically worsened. Census Bureau data indicate that the share of children deprived of living with two married parents has more than doubled. According to the General Social Survey, adults are a third less likely to spend a social evening with their neighbors than they were 50 years ago. The same survey indicates that weekly church attendance is down by a fourth and that general trust in people is lower by one third. The deterioration in the health of our relationships and in the institutions we have created to serve human needs, that is the decline in social capital, has received too little attention from researchers and policymakers. It plays an underappreciated role in the stubborn refusal of intergenerational upward mobility rates out of poverty to improve over time. And when we hear from the Harvard Public Opinion Project that half of adults under age 30 report being depressed and a quarter saying that they have considered self-harm, quote, several days in the last two weeks, it is social poverty rather than economic poverty that ought to command our attention. Today's event is intended to explore various dimensions of the decline in social capital. It launches an ambitious research project, The Social Breakdown, within the Center on Opportunity and Social Mobility. In 2014, current AEI President Robert Doerr began building what would become a top-tier program on poverty. COSM will expand the focus of this research to intergenerational mobility, social poverty, and opportunity. The social breakdown will draw inspiration from the groundbreaking social capital project created by Senator Mike Lee within the Joint Economic Committee of Congress. The social capital project, which was helmed for a time uh, both by myself uh, and by Kevin Corinth, the deputy director of COSM, uh, and which is ongoing in uh, the Joint Economic Committee, has renewed interest in distinctly social problems and explored how policy might mitigate those problems. We are honored to host Senator Lee for luncheon keynote remarks today. The American Enterprise Institute has a long history of concern with the health of social life, civil society, and institutions in America. The Mediating Structures Project was launched during the second half of the 1970s, producing the landmark track by Peter Berger and Richard John Newhouse to empower people, of which uh, I have a rare uh, original copy uh, in my hands. Uh, Berger and Newhouse articulated a vision for a welfare state that relied on mediating structures, institutions such as the family, neighborhoods, churches, and other voluntary associations to deliver its benefits. These four mediating structures, are, are, as it turns out, are reflected in our panels today on family, religious institutions, and culture, place, institutions, and civil society. The Mediating Structures Project spawned a plethora of activity at AEI, the 1982 policy volume Meeting Human Needs, the Neighborhood Revitalization Project, the Social Invention Project, and the 1987 volume The New Consensus on Family and Welfare. We are fortunate to feature three of the scholars associated with this early work in our morning keynote and in our first panel today. Civil society and social capital have also been the recurring subject of Charles Murray's work, featuring in his 1988 book, In Pursuit of Happiness and Good Government, and 2012's Coming Apart. Like Charles, Nick Eberstadt has been a leading scholar of economic poverty, but he's also been the foremost analyst of male disconnectedness from work. And a number of other AEI scholars, many of them here today, continue to emphasize the themes of social connectedness, the importance of place, the breakdown of institutions, and the deterioration of the family. I look forward to a productive day of discussion, and I would direct you to our website, cosm.aei.org, both to read our new research on religious traditions and social capital, and to stay up to date on future research uh, via our newsletter. 
Uh, before I introduce this morning's keynote speaker, I'll just say that his remarks will be followed by two morning panels. Um, Senator Lee will be introduced by Robert Doerr at noon, after which lunch will be served. We'll have two panels in the afternoon, wrap up at three, and we'll have a reception out here in the hall afterwards. Uh, and with that, I am thrilled to introduce our first keynote speaker, William Chambra. William Chambra is a senior fellow emeritus at Hudson Institute and co-editor of The Giving Review. Bill was at AEI from 1979 to 1988, where he was director of social policy programs and co-director of the Decade of Study of the Constitution Project. Subsequently, Chambra served in the Reagan and George H.W. Bush administrations as a senior advisor and chief speechwriter for Attorney General Edwin Meese III, director of the Office of Personnel and Management, Constance Horner, and Secretary of Health and Human Services, Lewis Sullivan. In 1992, Bill joined the Lind and Harry Bradley, Bradley Foundation as Director of Programs. He then started the Bradley Center for Philanthropy and Civic Renewal at Hudson Institute in 2003. From 1984 to 1990, Chambra served as a member of the National Historical Publications and Records Commission, to which he was appointed by President Reagan. From 2003 to 2006, he served on the board of directors of the Corporation for National and Community Service. He's edited a number of books, written extensively on civic revitalization, civil society, and the Constitution. I would say conservatism and the quest for community, delivered at AEI and available on the AEI website. We are fortunate to have him kick off our day. Uh, Bill, welcome. Well, thank you very much, uh, Chris, and, and uh, thank you, Carlin Bowman, for my ride in this morning and for 45 years of friendship that began here in the halls of, of AEI. Uh, as I reflect on the early days of mediating structures at AEI in the 1970s, two images come immediately to mind. One is a glimpse into the austere office of AEI scholar and sociologist Robert Nisbet, He's the matinee idle version of the academic, sitting ramrod straight at his desk, wearing a tweed tie and a tweed jacket and tie, typing out the first and pretty much the final version of his next book. It will be a lament for the decline in the authority of our social institutions after centuries of assault by the political state and a forlorn plea for conservatives to formulate some sort of response. The other image also involves an AEI sociologist, in this case, Peter Berger. He's sitting at one of our conference tables, quietly puffing a small, dry Dutch cigar. He's listening closely to a presentation, not by scholars, but by a group of young men clad in the latest urban chic, bearing names like Fat Rob Allen and Crazy Cat Mejias. With Robert Woodson's promptings, they're discussing their lives in urban youth gangs not just the dangers, but also the profound sense of community the gang provides. AEI's Mediating Structures Project emerged from the tension between these two dramatically different images. It was rooted in Nisbet's somewhat despairing, backward-looking account of the decline of society's intermediate associations, but it would arrive at Berger's and Woodson's tentatively hopeful look to a future where those associations have been revivified, though in forms we could not have imagined. Little of this is apparent, however, from a glance at the Ur text for the project, Peter Berger's and Richard John Newhouse's slim volume, To Empower People, published here in 1977. There, in that volume, the central state and the intermediate association are presented not as rivals or foes, uh, but as potential partners. Within the first few paragraphs, we're assured that the modern welfare state is here to stay, indeed that it ought to expand the benefits it provides, but that alternative mechanisms are possible to provide welfare state services. And we're all familiar with what those alternative mechanisms are. Chris just went through them. Neighborhood, uh, Scott, excuse me, neighborhood, church, voluntary association, family, uh, the institutions, uh, mediating st the institutions mediating between the private individual and the megastructures of society, especially government. 
Nothing could seem more reasonable, Berger and Newhouse suggest, than to have these still trusted and fam familiar social structures deliver the welfare state's goods and services at a time when trust in government had fallen. It would be a win-win, as they say. But Nisbet would have considered it highly unlikely that such a marriage of convenience would work out. After all, he maintained in the quest for community, society's mediating structures had been under relentless assault since the time of the French Revolution. After that cataclysmic event, and everywhere throughout the West, an all-encompassing centralized political power had been furiously dismantling the, the intermediate associations that obstructed its reach. The primary instrument for this assault had been the propagation of individualism. Doctrines of personal liberation attacked the legitimacy of seemingly backward and oppressive mediating structures, leaving individuals atomized and alienated. The political state, however, had a remedy for that, the great national community. The old partial and particular allegiances and loyalties that had once provided people their sense of meaning, purpose, and belonging would now be redirected to the state, where a far more glorious and powerful sense of belonging would be generated. In Nisbet's later writings, he came to identify this process more and more with American progressivism from Woodrow Wilson's downright authoritarian administration on through the New Deal and the Great Society, uh, progressivism worked to shift citizen loyalty from mediating structures to the state. The services that mediating structures had once provided would now be delivered instead by credentialed, professional, socialized uh, state experts whose training in the social sciences provided them a comprehensive, objective understanding of the public good. At the apex of this uh, federal pyramid would sit a powerful, articulate president who would proclaim, as did Lyndon Johnson, and I quote, I see a day ahead with a united nation, divided neither by class nor by section nor by color, knowing no south or north, no east or west, but just one great America, free of malice and free of hate, and loving thy neighbor as thyself. As a result of the assault on mediating structures, Nisbet argued, the West's original and genuine intermediate associations, guilds, established churches, monasteries, walled cities, had indeed been forever shattered by individualism and centralization. But if that's so, where would the mediating structures project turn to find new expressions of community? How do we go all the way from Nisbetian skepticism over to that group of young men talking with Bob Woodson about the sense of belonging and purpose they found in gangs? To appreciate that, it's necessary to understand how the legendary William J. Baroudi Sr. managed the American Enterprise Institute some 50 years ago. Not for him, today's elaborate and detailed research proposals staffed by lockstep conservative intellectuals and tailored to support, uh, to attract support from ideologically attuned donors. Had that been his style, mediating structures would never have gotten off the ground. Rather, he did all the fundraising himself with grants going into general operating support. He launched million dollar projects with a handshake. But the central characteristic of Baruti's management style was his willingness to allow policy proposals to emerge from the interplay of perspectives that were dramatically but fruitfully different, reflecting a variety of disciplines, walks of life, and political inclinations. <clears throat> Somehow intuitively, he knew which combinations would mutually clash and spark and resonate until something new and thoughtful emerged. The, te the telltale introduction for this process was always, you know, sociologist X, I think you'd really benefit from a conversation with community activist Y. To understand AEI's Mediating Structures Project, then one must look at the rich and varied list of scholars and practitioners Baruti gathered around himself to undertake the project. For a free market-oriented conservative think tank, this was a very strange and risky list indeed. Only Nisbet himself would have been considered a conservative. The rest of those contributing to the project had backgrounds 
very far from AEI's traditional economics orientation and well to its left. But they had one thing in common. They had witnessed the failure of the political state's project of national community. They suffered under its efforts to replace the great variety of associational life in America with distant, alienating, professionalized services. And they had begun to draw upon their own lives and histories to nominate alternative structures of communal purpose and meaning. Berger and Newhouse, for instance, had previously cooperated on a volume in 1970, but it was ominously entitled Movement and Revolution. From their mutual opposition to the Vietnam War and to racial discrimination, they were divided at the time only by the question, do we need to transform the system altogether? But over the 70s, they came to realize that progressivism was determined to drive religion from the public square and that they could not abide. Neoconservatives like Irving Kristol and Leslie Linkowski were part of the project. Most of them were advocates of a conservative welfare state. But as Nathan Glazer put it, they had also come to appreciate the limits of social policy. Uh, according to Glazer, that policy started as an effort to relieve distress by replacing deteriorating social structures with professionalized services, but that only contributes to further deterioration. In an example of unintended consequences, as he put it, our efforts to deal with distress, with distress themselves increase distress. Theologian Michael Novak had been a speechwriter for the McGovern-Shriver campaign in 1972. In The Rise of the Unmeltable Ethnics, published around that time, he, he launched an attack on the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant elite that would have warmed the heart of any populist today. Novak drew upon his Slavic roots to sketch out sources of purpose and belonging to be found in the long forgotten and much despised Central European and Catholic origins of millions of Americans. He hoped to refound the Democratic Party on the organic networks of communal life, family, ethnic groups, and voluntary associations. Finally, Bob Woodson, who's here with us today, uh, was invited to join the project from the Urban League after a career of community organizing on the left. But he had witnessed the failure of progressivism's approach to youth crime. In the AI, in the AI volume, A Summons to Life, he held up as an alternative the model of Sister Falaka Fatah and her House of Umoja in Philadelphia. In her home, Sister Fatah supplied a healthy version of the urban gang's sense of community through her reimagination of the extended African family, hardly the typical conservative point of reference. Baruti must have seen something of his own experience in the histories of those he recruited. Although he was from New Hampshire, he was hardly a typical rock-ribbed Yankee Republican. Instead, he was the Arab-American son of Lebanese stonecutters, the patriarch of a huge extended family, and a prominent lay leader in this small but ancient Melkite Catholic church. None of this would have predisposed him to be a typical conservative intellectual. But it left him with a great reservoir of communal resources that suggested what might come next after the failure of progressivism. From the conversation among these bewilderingly different scholars and activists assembled by Baruti came suggestions for a flood of distinctly non-traditional institutional forms that would become tomorrow's versions of family, neighborhood, church, and voluntary association. Informal extended families based on ancestral patterns Neighborhoods and voluntary associations built around varieties of ethnic experiences, experience that had previously been held in contempt. Forms of worship located not in cathedrals, but in storefronts, ringing with modes of worship that were fresh, exuberant, and spontaneous. So what does this story about mediating structures origins suggest about today's project on social capital? First, it should put our current despair about their fate into perspective. After all, when Berger, Newhouse, Berger and Newhouse wrote, the progressive onslaught against mediating structures had been underway for seven decades in America. Nisbet would have insisted that it had been underway in the West since 1792. 
When we tote up the reasons for the deterioration of intermediate associations in America, we tend to focus on social and technological shifts. When Robert Putnam first chronicled the decline of associations in 1980s, as you recall, in bowling alone, we thought the chief culprit was television. But we often fail to note the not insignificant fact that America's predominant governing philosophy had been actively working to destroy mediating structures for decades. It's amazing that anything was left of them at all. In spite of that hostility, AEI's work went on to inspire a bipartisan resurgence of interest in intermediate associations from 1980 to 2000, thanks not only to Baruti Sr., but also to his sons, uh, Bill Baruti Jr. and Michael, who were strategically placed within Republican politics to advance the project. Uh, this found expression in Ronald Reagan's private sector initiatives and his call for a return to the human scale, George H.W. Bush's Thousand Points of Light, and George W. Bush's Faith and Community Initiatives. Indeed, Les and Bob played critical roles in the last of these. These efforts laid the groundwork for the, period, uh, for the uh, period's most significant social policy development, an approach to welfare reform based on the centrality of family and community, as described in Lenkowski's Novak's and Doug Besharov's volume for AEI, The New Consensus on Family and Welfare. So don't count out mediating structures, no matter how besieged they may seem to be. The other lesson to be learned from this brief history is that we have no idea what the next wave of mediating structures might look like. A Nisbet conservative would have looked around in 1977 and despaired. In response, Baruti, Berger, and Newhouse brought together an unlikely crew of activists and scholars animated by understandings of communal solidarity that were anything but traditionally conservative. We must open ourselves, I think, to that possibility again. Uh, that will be tough. It will mean challenging our own ideological and methodological predispositions. The last time I saw Peter Berger, I asked him whom he considered to be the chief disciple of his mediating structures work, and he answered without hesitation, Bob Woodson. I have to agree, <clears throat> and it's related to this question of openness to the next generation of mediating structures. That's why Bob Woodson's work in particular is the final and fitting hopeful response to Nisbet's historically oriented despair. Woodson's work in Philadelphia prefaced decades of further investigation of grassroots initiatives of all sorts around the nation, where all the scholarly experts on poverty looked at low-income neighborhoods and saw nothing but desolation and dysfunction. Woodson had the eyes to see something else. He quietly sought out the barbers and beauty shop owners and tavern keepers and asked questions like this. Who in this neighborhood do you turn to when things are tough? Who's got the best advice about returning to sobriety, to finding a job, to dealing with a wayward child? Invariably, the neighborhood did not turn to professional service providers, but rather to a list of trusted, engaged local citizens who were building their own versions of mediating structures in boxing gyms and senior care facilities, storefront churches, based on their own painful but successful personal and communal efforts to reconstruct their own lives. He found this especially in those modest churches. Woodson came to affirm that faith in particular drove most of his grassroots leaders, though this was not an explanatory variable that progressive analysts respected, and it was a fervent and exuberant mode of faith that was a bit much for, for staid and sober Nisbet conservatives. In short, Woodson was absolutely open and available to what the neighborhoods were doing for themselves, to paraphrase W.B. Du Bois. He recognized that grassroots leaders were working from a kind of hard-won wisdom that was closed and unavailable to the learned and the credentialed. Bob and I have come to appreciate in particular James C. Scott's description of this other kind of wisdom in his magnificent book, Seeing Like a State. The ancient Greek, Scott said, described it as metis. It's an entirely bottom-up, local, concrete, and particular kind of knowledge acquired through experience. It's unlike most of our knowing today, which is top-down, abstract, 
theoretical, and acquired through academic instruction. If we are to recognize and welcome the next round of mediating structures, we have to understand that our methodological predispositions are likely to work against them. Our own academic technologies can measure how badly eroded our largest social institutions have become, but largely undetected and far beneath that massive visible layer of, de of decay, Nidus and probably the Holy Spirit are at work in the hearts and minds of grassroots leaders across the country. They're closest to the collapse of old forms of association. They suffer most immediately its effects, and, those, and so they are most capable and determined to come up with solutions. That's where the next generation of mediating structures will come from, not from think tanks or universities. The solutions will look nothing like what we expect, but just as was the Mediating Structures Project in 1977, we must be open today to that grassroots wisdom. One final note, no one would appreciate this advice more than the luncheon speaker at today's event, Senator Mike Lee of Utah. Like many other politicians, he's written a book on the American founding, but unlike others, his account ventures well beyond the usual pantheon of constitutional framers. The title of his book is Written Out of History, The Forgotten Founders Who Fought Big Government. These include the Iroquois Confederation leader, Canasetego, who is a discipline, a, a disciple of federalism, Mum Bet, one of the first African Americans to insist that the nation's new commitment to equality applied to her as well, and Mercy Otis Warren, whose history of the American Revolution warned against the concentration of power in the central government. The senator's point is subtle but clear. Yes, our founding principles endure, but in this new age, we need to find advocates who may little resemble the familiar figures we consider founders. So with mediating structures, they remain indispensable, but tomorrow's versions may not look like what we expect. We nonetheless must welcome them. AEI has a notable history of this sort of openness that. Uh, Scott just sketched with scholars and fellows like Ryan Streeter, Yuval Levin, Howard Husek, Tim Carney, and Paul Ryan. And with this new project on social uh, capital headed by Scott, we can expect a warm welcome here uh, to the next generation of mediating structures. Thank you so much for those remarks, uh, Bill. I'll let everyone get settled a moment. Um, just a great way to frame uh, the rest of the day, I think, um, and uh, to put in perspective uh, the work that we're trying to do moving forward um, uh, with, with all the work that's been done before um, and highlighting uh, what's changed and a number of the uh, enduring issues that have not changed. <clears throat> Um, so I'm uh, pleased to moderate uh, now a panel with some of the other uh, founders, uh, forebears uh, of, of uh, research on social capital and civil society, research and practitioners um, uh, being a really important point, as Bill said. Um, we've already met Bill, so uh, let me introduce uh, the other two panelists. I think in future panels we're going to keep uh, the, the introductions a little bit short, but I want to sort of... Uh, tout uh, 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 these two gentlemen who um, uh, who have just had impressive careers in this area. Um, first is uh, Robert L. Woodson, Sr. Um, Bob is the founder and president of the Woodson Center, 1776 Unites, and Voices of Black Mothers United. Bob directed the Administration of Justice Division at the National Urban League in the 1970s. Uh, he was here at AEI from 1974 to 1981 where he was a resident fellow and directed the Neighborhood Revitalization Project. Uh, there he edited Youth, Crime, and Urban Policy, A View from the Inner City, and A Summons to Life, Mediating Structures and the Prevention of Youth Crime, both published in 1981. That year, he founded the Center for Neighborhood Enterprise, which later became the Woodson Center. He's an important figure in the movement for civil rights, a MacArthur genius, and we're glad to have him today. Uh, Bob, uh, hear your remarks. 
Thank you. All right. I, I've been defined as the only non-communist to get the MacArthur grant. <laughs> I think because of my work with low-income people, they got fooled. They thought I was progressive. So, but it was too late. I had the check and I cashed it. <laughs> it was a funny story because, um, you know, uh, I got a, you get invited to Chicago uh, to, to there once you get your grant, and they're socialists, so, but they stay at the New Atani Hotel and um, find lunch. And so after, and then we had to watch whales uh, who won it, you know off the coast of Alaska. And my wife and I, in response, uh, left and went to uh, Neiman Marcus and shopped, <laughs> just to cleanse myself. <laughs> anyway, this is not where I'm here. But um, I, I want to just give you a little background. I was, as, as you were saying, I was a veteran of the civil rights movement and very active, and then I got this call from the American, and Peter Berger, to join him and some other scholars as a practitioner. I found out from him that I was an empiricist. <laughs> uh, and I was invited to join Von den Haag, um, uh, Peter Berger, Newhouse, for, for a three-day seminar on discussing a urban policy. And I was in the criminal justice system uh, for the Urban League, and I remember, uh, getting into this intense debate over the course of three days with James Q. Wilson, who was the leading person at that time on reduction of youth violent, crime. And his thesis was that if you increase the cost of crime, crime would exponentially go down, and therefore it was very transactional. Um, and so when I heard this, you know, I just said, well, threatening the people that I know with retaliation, or it's like threatening kamikaze pilot with death. You don't understand. They don't expect to live. So how can you threaten somebody with something? And, 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 and so I, I was able to describe that in order for these young people um, to respond to sanctions, there first must be investment. And so we talked about Sister Fatah and the grassroots leaders who, and so let me just uh, give you three examples of, of where government failed and destroyed people with the helping hand. How mediating structures prevailed um, in, in, when government failed. And then a, a, a third example of, I think, where the proper balance occurred. That may be, be helpful. On terms of a failure, as you know, the responsibility for the care of kids who were abandoned and neglected by their parents or abused at the turn of the century was largely in taken care of by informal institutions when each, each ethnic group had their child welfare uh, programs of taking care of neglected children. But their moral obligation to these kids was consistent with their economic interests because it was expensive to maintain children away from stable homes and therefore, there were incentives to, uh, to, to re, re, either re, reconstruct the home or to put them in adoption. But when the um, economy tanked and government intervened for the first time in the area of foster care, they only provided subsidy for children that are in foster care. And so as a consequence, the whole private sector became influenced, and, and, and that's when we see kids were coming into the system. Studies reveal that only three or five percent of children coming into the system as infants have any psychological dysfunction. It's their environment. But by policy, children are discouraged from bonding with foster parents, so it's not unlike uh, that they experience sometimes three to five moves in the course of five years and as a consequence, they deteriorate. The more they deteriorate, the deeper they go into the system. So they go from a foster home where the reimbursement rate is $10,000. And then as they act out, then they go deeper to a therapeutic home at a reimbursement rate of 15000 And then if they continue to decline, it goes up and up. And so as a consequence, government destroyed this whole system of care uh, and so that's an example. 
An example of where uh, uh, mediating structures prevailed where government failed was with Sister Fatah. Philadelphia, my hometown, was the youth gang capital of America. The 48 gang deaths, they would list the gang deaths next to the Vietnam deaths. And uh, Sister Fatah found that she and her husband living four blocks from where I was raised in a low-income black neighborhood. She found out the oldest of her six sons was a gang member, so she invited them to bring his friends home. And because her husband was an old gangster, we call him OGs, he negotiated with the local gang for his friends, 15 of them, to come into the neighborhood. Well, they sat up all night, long story short. She said, I know nothing about gangs, but I know something about family, so why don't you join ours? She said, well, I have six sons, 15 boys, one bathroom, small. So they got rid of all the furniture and put mattresses all over. And she said, if we had to live together, we have to learn how to cooperate. We have to be clean. We have to work. In the course of three years, they retired her mortgage in two years. And when word went out that there was sanctuary, other kids knocked on her door every day. And at the end of three years, they had five houses, a hundred young men from all over the city. She said, if we can live together peacefully here, why can't we do it throughout the whole city? And so she said she was going to have a, a gang summit. None of the black churches would give them a place, a venue for the, for the conference. But the Quakers did their fourth and Arch Street building. And on New Year's Day, they had this gang summit where all of these young men that she had were ambassadors, went back and brought these young men together at the, at the fourth and Arch Street. They, stopped, they, they canceled the Members Day Parade because they said it would create chaos, but it didn't create chaos. So long story short is that in 1974, Philadelphia went down from 48 gang deaths down to two and remained there for a long time. In 83, there was a resurgence of young men attacking people on the streets. It spread like wildfire to police. Umoja came together with four young men, went to the local prison, signed up 134 inmates as a crime prevention task force. They sent for uh, uh, 200 young people. We brought them to the prison. The problem disappeared throughout the, the whole city. Not a, and Marvin Wolfgang and the, uh, the scholars at the University of Pennsylvania School of Criminal Justice was funded to, re, to, re, uh, to develop strategies to reduce youth violence. Not a single scholar ever visited the Umoja to find out why and how they were able to accomplish this thing, but we did. One other example of, of so there's an example of, of mediating structures succeeding where government failed in a very profound way that had, an, and, and it was to me a national model, but it was ignored by the community, both left and right of center. One quick example of where government works in cooperation with mediating structures, and that is resident management of public housing. When the um, Newt Gingrich and Steve, uh, Dick Army and Steve Bartlett were freshmen, and the Republicans were not in power, Jack Kemp, they established the Opportunity Society, and they came into public housing and had a hearing uh, to ask residents here in Washington D.C. how they were able to reduce violence in their community, how they were able to encourage kids to go to college, how they were able to create an island of excellence in one of the most toxic, drug-infested neighborhoods. They held hearings to ask low-income mediating structures how they accomplished what they did. And because these conservatives came down when liberals wouldn't, it became the lead story on every television channel. And then Henry Gonzalez, of course, when he found out this publicity, his, his committee had hearings there. But after that, J Jack Kemp did something he very seldom did, and that's sit for, sit for six, three hours with a pad and listen to grassroots leaders from around the country explain how they were able to take control of their ethnic. And so what we did was they identified seven amendments of the Housing Act that would help residents to take not only management control, but also ownership of it. 
and uh, we were able to uh, acquire a grant from the Amico Fa Fa uh, Corporation for $4 million. We hired Kubis and Libran, a firm to come in and, and do the cost benefit of resident management. Um, and then we had hearings with Jack Kemp and we, we were able to uh, secure uh, the passage of seven amendments to the Housing Act that, that was passed into law, 93. We got Bill Armstrong from, uh, Illinois, from uh, Colorado uh, and, and I I Dixon uh, in Illinois, co-sponsored it, 93 to zero in the, in the Senate, 130, 430 in the House, and Reagan signed it into law. There's an example of where, uh, where professionals outside the issue is how can you, uh, with grassroots mediated structures, it's important to be on tap but not on top, and listen to the residents uh, and, and, and chronicle what they do, but not a, in, in terms of House of Yamoja and the resident management of public housing and other breakthroughs that we've had in terms of intervention what is notable is that very seldom do anyone from the academy or the think tanks ever come to evaluate what was accomplished and how it was accomplished. Thank you, Bob. That's uh, very important. Criticism uh, and your examples are, are, are really apt. Um, I want to turn now uh, to Leslie Lenkowski. Um, Les is an emeritus professor in public affairs and philanthropic studies at Indiana University's Paul H. O'Neill School of Public and environmental affairs. Uh, whether your reference point is uh, Woody Allen's Zelig or Forrest Gump or Ted Lasso's Roy Kent, uh, Les is here, he's there, uh, he's everywhere over the years in center right policy making uh, related to poverty and social capital. Uh, among other positions, he was president of the Institute for Educational Affairs, which spawned the Philanthropy Roundtable, uh, which he later directed. He was also director of research at the Smith Richardson Foundation. Uh, Les was at AEI uh, during 1985 when he started the Social Invention Project with Michael Novak, uh, which produced the volume I mentioned earlier, The New Consensus on Family and Welfare. That book informed welfare reform uh, in 1988 uh, that passed, and ultimately the reforms that passed in 1996. Uh, Les had another role in those 1996 reforms. Uh, he was the president of uh, Hudson Institute during the 1990s uh, when it was very directly involved in the state reforms uh, that were taking place. President Bill Clinton made Les one of the uh, founding directors of the Corporation for National and Community Service, and President George W. Bush appointed him CEO of the corporation. Uh, we're thrilled to have him here. Uh, take it away, Les. Thanks very much, Scott. When you compared me to Roy Kent, I was afraid you would use a certain word uh, that anyone who's watched Ted Lasso will see, but thank you for not doing that. Um, and it's great to be back here at AEI to be with Bob and Bill. We've had a long number of years and lots of fights together and occasionally against one another. So um, it's good to be back here. Well, I want to just talk make a couple of points about what I see as the legacy of mediating structures. Uh, first of all, I think the despair that Bill referred to earlier, that Bob Nisbet and many others had, about progressivism, uh, the growth of the state was a bit over, overdone. Uh, the period 1890 through 1920 uh, is often referred to not just as the progressive era, but among scholars of philanthropy as the um, golden era of fraternity. That is the period in which all sorts of fraternal orders, organizations that are household names now, like the YMCA, YWCA, the Boys and Girls Clubs, and so on, were formed and thrived at exactly the same time. As Bill described, we were seeing uh, a resurgence of uh, a kind of statism under Woodrow Wilson. Uh, indeed, at the beginning of the pandemic, there is an archive on ed everything, I think, and there is the archive on the Spanish flu uh, will be found at the University of Michigan. And at the beginning of the most recent pandemic, the COVID pandemic, the director of that archive was frequently quoted 
And one of the things he said in comparing this, the COVID pandemic to the Spanish flu, <clears throat> he said there was a greater sense of civic responsibility at the time of the Spanish flu than he sees today. And I think he's largely right on that. He attributed it to the effects of World War I and mobilization. However, I think it probably had much more to do with the growth of um, uh, all sorts of associations in the previous 30 years. In fact, the phrase social capital uh, was coined in 1916 by a gentleman who was uh, a West Virginia commissioner for rural education. And in writing about it, uh, he described social capital very much in the terms we would use today. So something was going on in that period, not just the uh, rise of progressivism. It's also, I think, important to point out that one of the most important, one of the, one of the reasons uh, the American Enterprise Institute's embrace of mediating structures was important and widely noted was it seemed to go against the tr a very important trend at the time. A form of individualism was being embraced first on the left in the 1960s and then in the 1970s on the right, eventually metastasizing to Margaret Thatcher's famous comment that there is no such thing as society. Uh, and the publication of To Empower People suggested to many people that there was an alternative, certainly on the right of the political spectrum, to this kind of individualism, which was understood correctly, I think, as having a lot of destructive qualities, not for nothing. Uh, for that reason, I think, To Empower People, at the time, I believe, was the best-selling publication the American Enterprise Institute had ever produced. Uh, and uh, the sales were across the political and ideological spectrum uh, to businessmen as well. I was at Smith Richardson Foundation in New York then, and we were certainly very much aware of it. Um, I think it was because it signified a reaction to a kind not only of, of government expansion, but a sort of rampant individualism uh, that was becoming a factor, had become a factor in American life. Now, as Bill said, one result of To Empower People was to give a lot more attention to the mediating structures. It went, this go, went far, of course, beyond um, the effects of mediating structures. The 1960s and 1970s were a very bad decade, two decades for civic associations. A combination of a, a poor economy, a tax law in 1969 that put new regulations on philanthropy and nonprofit organizations and other factors led no less a figure than John D. Rockefeller III to write in a widely publicized Reader's Digest article at the end of the 1970s that the American tradition of civic, of the nonprofits, the nonprofit sector, by this he meant civic associations more broadly, was an endangered sector. And that was the perception well into the late 1970s. However, following upon to empower people, but also for other reasons as well, we've seen a enormous change in this. There are university programs in hundreds of universities uh, dealing, preparing students for careers, working in nonprofit associations of all types. Uh, public policy scholars are much more attentive to uh, the role of these associations than they used to be. Uh, there's a, now it's I think a bi-weekly public, well it appears on the web daily, publication called the Chronicle of Philanthropy that hadn't been in place before. One could go on with a long list, but 
clearly mediating structures are now uh, uh, of much more interest. And this project, in fact, is a reflection of that, and even more so that the Joint Economic Committee would devote, uh, what was it, about two years, three years, something like that, to studying social capital suggests uh, its prominence. Now, these issues, the, the subject had never gone away. Obviously, Nisbet wrote about it, Dan Bell, Marty Lipset, lots of others had been studying it before, but to empower people, uh, tr help trigger off a new round of interest in these associations, which continues today. Well, what concretely did to empower people accomplish? Uh, there's a sense, I think it's fair to say, although some might disagree, that the publication and the projects that followed didn't produce as much as had been hoped for. Uh, there was a lot of effort, as had been described, uh, behind them at the time. But I think this is too pessimistic a view. There have been, and some of them have already been mentioned today, changes in public policy aimed at the first of the Berger and Newhouse two propositions to reduce the harm of public policy on mediating structures. Welfare reform, obviously, is one very important one, but there are others as well. Less well recognized, I think, is how public policy has developed ways of trying to strengthen mediating structures. Berger and Newhouse um, and others involved in the project were less sure that these were possible. And we got a sense of that from Bob Nisbet's concern that Bill quoted. And yet, <clears throat> we've done a number of things in the past um, uh, 40 years uh, that really aim in one way or the other, even if not directly and even if not perfectly, um, at helping mediating structures. Think of the, ra the range of innovations in education, vouchers, charter schools, homeschooling, and many more that basically aim at providing alternatives for, to public school education that rely more on associational groups of one sort or another. Community-based policing, again, perhaps carried to an extreme in certain jurisdictions, is now, I would argue, the more dominant approach to policing compared to the uh, old technocratic style epitomized uh, by the television show uh, Dragnet. Uh, the faith-based initiative has been referred to already, and I was very much involved in creating the National Service Program AmeriCorps, which looks like, from the outside, as exactly the kind of program that the Berger Newhouse first proposition would warn against. Why would you pay people to volunteer? Uh, well, as we were working on it, and I agree, I, I would, I certainly would not disagree that there are, somebody described AmeriCorps once as a Swiss army knife uh, in that you could see it as performing a variety of functions. Uh, what I saw it, and the way I explained it to President Bush 43, was what could you do to help faith-based and community organizations? What you could do is give them what they most need, which is people, young people, uh, and, let, and, and not put requirements on very, very broad program area requirements in America, or at least there used to be, um, so that these people would then work on tasks that the organizations felt they needed done. And in that sense, national service played a very practical role in trying to assist faith-based and community groups. So anyway, I think there's a robust legacy on which AEI's new project uh, can build, and I'm delighted uh, to see it created. There's more awareness today of the family, the neighborhood, church, and civic groups in American society. 
and there have been some useful changes in public policy in non-governmental institutions like universities and the press that will aid mediating structures. But I do want to raise two worrisome signs. First, according to a variety of research, public confidence and participation in these institutions and particularly the more formal civic associations is much less than it used to be. And then secondly, and in my view, not unrelatedly, uh, a large set of these associations, the professionalized and well-funded among them, not necessarily the grassroots groups that Bob works so effectively with, are not sure they really want to mediate anymore. They're much, they see their role as actually trying to deliver uh, public services, usually meaning government services, uh, in one way or another. So I think the challenge going forward for AEI's research team is not just to protect and strengthen the mediating structures, but also to restore their sense of purpose as organizations that fill the gap between the individual and the state. Although he was not as much involved with this project as he was with other work of the American Enterprise Institute, the management guru, Peter Drucker, about the time of the, not long after the publication of To Empower People, turned his attention away from business consulting to thinking, writing, and working on nonprofit management. He had a very elegant definition of the difference between business and nonprofits. The job of a business is to produce a better product. The job of a nonprofit is to produce a better person. Unfortunately, in large segments of the nonprofit world today, they've become very businesslike aimed at producing better products. Uh, what needs to happen, what I hope this project will foster, is to remind them that their real role is building better people and a better society. Thank you. Thanks very much, Les. Um, I I think, so we've got 10 minutes left. Uh, I think I'm going to uh, take the moderator's prerogative and, and just ask a question. Um, so I'm wondering uh, whether the, the extent to which the decline in social capital, um, on the one hand, uh, maybe makes renewing mediating structures that much more important, uh, but at the same time uh, may make it more difficult, uh, if, if you think of it in terms of sort of muscles that uh, a lot of places haven't flexed in a long time. Um, is, is it uh, more challenging today uh, to sort of reform policies in ways that would leverage medi mediating structures than it would have been in 1977? Well, first of all, I, uh, I have to take issue with, with less on the issue of, of um, the, uh, the importance that we've assigned to it. I think it was, it was a bestseller, and there was a keen interest in it. And, but unfortunately, uh, the various administrations from Reagan to Bush and all, they, it became sidelined. It became minimized. It became a kind of conservative volunteerism, uh, a sideshow to the main business. It was never, uh, it, when we dealt with the resident management issue, we were talking about the transfer of public property to private individuals who, and today as I ride past there, it's all been gentrified. If those residents had been given the means to own it, they would have been profiting from the, uh, the rise. And, but it was never, it was never. What we, what we descended into doing is just whining about what the left is doing. And also, whenever we were writing about uh, a poor people, it was always sanctions and incentives. Let's have uh, drug testing for food stamps. Let's have work requirements. And we're supportive of that. But that's the only thing that you heard from conservatives is, 
what the poor are doing to, to uh, uh, against. It was nothing about incentives. And, and I think that oftentimes mediating structures was used by my conservative colleagues to recruit, as Bill says, unorthodox people to the conservative movement. It was not uh, designed to be a, a foundation upon which we govern, and that's what we were looking for in the neighborhood. We wanted partnerships with people to help us take over a, a, a public property and own it and to better manage our lives. But, but that was not, the, the, we didn't get that. The, the only person I know that took it seriously was Dick Reardon, in, 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 uh, Republican, came into East L.A., got together with Sister Ginny Lichtenberg and, and the local uh, low-income Hispanic people, recruited his fans, built the Reardon Center, a first-class facility. Then he, he planted charitably and he harvested politically. And these liberal Hispanics voted for him, and he became the first Republican in 35 years to be the mayor of Los Angeles. And it, when he got reelected in four years, he carried 60% of every demographic, racial and ethnic demographic, because he understood how to come in and, and meet people where they are and help them to get what they want. Republicans and conservatives ignored Dick Reardon. No one ever talks about Dick Reard and what he accomplished. Well, I do disagree with Bob. I think the, maybe it's more a semantic disagreement than an actual one. Ideas have consequences, but not necessarily directly. And when you put ideas out into the firmament, they have a way of filtering around. But let me get directly to your question, which is, yes, I think the challenge is now are considerably greater for mediating structures. Again, I'm going to speak mostly of the world I know well, which are the formal ones, who are represented here in Washington by an organization called Independent Sector, which I have said probably ought to, in the interest of accuracy, retitle itself Dependent Sector, because the relationships between the public sector and at least the top tier, the professionalized nonprofits, about 10% of the workforce we estimate works in one or another type of nonprofit, has grown far apace, which is to say one has to be very ingenious in thinking about this. One thing I'm tracking, and I, I, I know, Scott, you've been interested in this, uh, a, pub, a fundraising company published a study a few weeks ago uh, indicating that online giving was going up. We know that. But they were particularly interested to see it going up among Gen Z. Kind of suspected that would be the case, too. But also within Gen Z, among members who were more religious. Uh, and there have been a couple of other studies. I don't know how many of you heard about a two-week revival in a small college in Kentucky called Asbury College. Thousands of young students just camped out there, and there wasn't a Billy Graham to draw them there. So I don't know whether we're seeing something going on. I noticed the Surgeon General was talking a lot about loneliness in the last few days. Well, loneliness obviously has very bad consequences, but it will also prompt people to do other things. And I think to find the way, what are those other things, to do exactly what Bob has been saying for years, go in and talk to people. What are they doing to overcome loneliness may lead to some creative solution. Great, I think we have time for one question. Uh, yes. Uh, can you say your name as well? Uh, J.P. Hogan. Uh, you brought up AmeriCorps. I've always wondered, did it actually manage to be set up where it isn't more unconstitutional? The government is too much a neighbor first resort, uh, where it would be uh, asking people to have more. It's too close to whether AmeriCorps would be legal versus religious liberty. 
um, where are the laws on how you can set that up where it isn't too close to being a national religion or a state religion? You're practicing the behavior and the open heart. Yeah, there are a lot of issues there, but I certainly spent a lot of time when I was in office wondering whether we were violating the rules at the time about church state. Um, in fact, this relationship with religious charities was set up during the Clinton administration by my predecessor, Harris Wofford. So I would, when I traveled, make a point of wanting to visit faith-based organizations that were hosting AmeriCorps members. Because I knew I would be asked about this in Congress. And so when I visited a stroke victims hospital run by the Franciscan Order in Wheaton, Illinois. And after getting the tour, I sat down with the volunteer coordinator. This was actually a senior core program. And I asked her, do you have to be a Catholic to volunteer here, which would be illegal? Um, and she looked, gave me one of those looks that said, boy, you people in Washington ask the dumbest questions. And she proceeded to explain to me that it gets very cold in Wheaton, Illinois during the winters, that her normal uh, uh, volunteers flee for the west coast of Florida, and that she still got stroke victims to care for. And she will take anyone who is willing to wheel people around, comfort them, and even say a prayer with them if the patient initiates it, which is legal. So I think what I concluded from that and many others like it was that at a pragmatic level, among the actual mediating structures, these big constitutional arguments I was debating with Barney Frank uh, and Congressman Scott from Richmond in congressional hearings were of less concern. In most places, people were trying to pragmatically figure out how to do what they were committed to doing and to use resources, including AmeriCorps members, legally to do it. Final thoughts from Bill, Bill and Bob? That's, that's great. Um, just a quick thought, you know, how one moves forward. As Les suggests, <clears throat> The world of philanthropy and nonprofits uh, is uh, almost completely oriented now toward government. You know, getting getting funding from government, delivering the services of government. It bears no resemblance uh, to what I think Berger and Newhouse. Well, Berger and Newhouse warned about this that they would become too oriented toward government, and indeed, I think they have. Uh, the thing about American philanthropy, though, for instance, is that the Lined and Harry Bradley Foundation in Milwaukee can just up one day and say, Bob Woodson, come, come to Milwaukee and help us find some of those grassroots groups that you've been talking about. And Bob did this uh, back in the 90s, and we identified a number of grassroots groups through his services. Uh, that fulfilled perfectly this understanding of mediating structures and their role in, in uh, mobilizing citizens to solve their problems for themselves rather than petitioning government. There's always the danger, right, of, of it being uh, subverted and, and uh, uh, bought off by government, and there's always a struggle. But those groups are always being regenerated at the, that's sort of what I was, the final thought is those groups are always there. They're always being regenerated because people are in these communities desperate to solve their own problems. They face the problems every day and they're not passive victims. They refuse to be. They want to be uh, uh, active problem solvers in their community. And American philanthropy can actually support that, can actually find them and support that. It's perfectly within their purview to do that, but they are riddled, uh, even conservative foundations are completely riddled with bureaucratic obstacles to that process. Great, well thank you all so much uh, for kicking off uh, the day, uh, sharing your hard uh, won lessons. Um, 
uh, from being on the ground and being uh, in the think tank world and being in government. Um, everyone join me for a round of applause. We'll, we'll take a 10 minute break and then we'll meet back here for the next panel. Thank you.
Everyone take their uh, seats. We'll be starting in just momentarily, including you, Scott. Well, thank you, everyone, uh, for coming back to our uh, second panel. Uh, just to introduce myself, uh, my name is Kevin Corinth. I am a senior fellow and the deputy director of the Center on Opportunity and Social Mobility here at AEI. Um, so I have the pleasure of uh, moderating our second panel entitled The Nearest Associations, The Family and Social Capital. Um, given the, uh, the caliber of our panelists, um, and the fact that I want you to hear from them rather than me, I'm going to skip long introductions. Um, instead, I will just uh, give current affiliations and we'll start on remarks. Um, immediately to my right is Brad Wilcox. Uh, Brad is a non-resident senior fellow here at AEI, a professor of sociology at the University of Virginia, and the senior fellow at the Institute for Family Studies. Uh, next, we will be hearing from Bell Sawhill. Bell is a senior fellow in economic studies at the Brookings Institution, where she works uh, in the Center on Children and Families and on the future of the Middle Class Initiative. Finally, we'll be hearing from Ian Rowe. Ian is a senior fellow at AEI. He is the co-founder of Vertex Partnership Academies and a senior visiting fellow at the Woodson Center. Uh, so the format today will be uh, five minutes for each of our, our panelists. Um, we'll have some slides and some introductory remarks. After that, I will moderate um, a discussion and we'll turn it out uh, for audience questions at the end. Uh, with that, I will turn it over to Brad. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin, for that gracious uh, introduction. So what I want to say this morning as we think about kind of this broader theme of social breakdown um, that Scott has introduced for us this morning is focused on kind of one particular dimension of that, and that is that I think we're seeing kind of the American heart uh, closing uh, before our very eyes. Um, so what I mean by that is our civilization is in the midst of an epical shift a shift away from marriage and all the fruits that follow from this most fundamental social institution. Children, kin, financial stability, and innumerable opportunities to love and be loved by another. This is dark news because we are, as Aristotle taught us, social animals. We thrive most when we have deep and abiding ties to other human beings. And for most of us, no such ties are as important as those found in hearth and home. So what am I talking about here uh, this morning? What I'm talking about are kind of trends like the ones that are just up on the screen here, which tell us, for instance, that we're seeing about a 65% uh, decline in the marriage rate from 1970 to the present. What does that mean kind of practically, though, for kind of the ordinary young adult, uh, even sitting here in this room uh, right now? And there are obviously a number of you. What it means is about one in three of today's young adults uh, will never end up marrying. And this is kind of record demographic territory for us. We've never kind of had trends that will be kind of this distinctive, and I would say this sobering when it comes you know, to marriage, for instance. What about fertility, kind of another kind of expression of opening our hearts to you know, in, in the next generation here? we see here is that the fertility rates kind of come down since the Great Recession to record low rates, about 1.6 in 2020. It ticked up a little bit in 2021, but we think probably it'll go back down uh, fairly soon as well here. And so again, kind of what does that mean practically for young adults in general? Obviously, again, there are a number of you here um, in the room uh, this morning. What we think is that about one in four of today's young adults will never have kids. So kind of what we're seeing then, obviously, when it comes to both sort of marriage and parent is kind of like a staggering rise in kinlessness, I think, looming on the horizon for you know, many, many young adults um, in, in this country. Now, I want to be kind of clear here that there are some, I think, silver linings associated with this dramatic shift in American family life. And one of those silver linings is that as marriage and parenthood become more selective, 
that we are seeing a slight uptick in family stability for kids across the US, um, as this figure here indicates. So we're seeing, again, kind of a slight increase in the share of kids who are living in intact married families um, because uh, Americans are entering into both marriage and parenthood on a more selective basis. Um, Americans, particularly on the marriage front, who are more educated, more affluent, but also more religious and even more conservative are the ones today who are most likely to get married. And those things are generally associated with more family uh, stability for kids. So that's sort of like the silver lining here in the middle of my comments uh, this morning. But this closing of the American heart, and I'm thinking primarily of kind of this retreat from marriage, is, is bad news for adults because we see so much evidence of the ways in which marriage advances the welfare of adults, of men and women, you know, economically, socially, and as this figure here suggests to you, um, emotionally. So it's in that sense that kind of this, this decline that's um, happening in marriage is, um, is bad news. Now I think as everyone in this building especially knows, this retreat from marriage, this decline in marriage is stratified by class. That's kind of old news, I think, in this, in this room, certainly at Brookings as well. Um, but I want us to also kind of understand and appreciate, and this is somewhat new news, that this closing of the American heart when it comes to marriage is not just limited to working class and poor Americans. It's also kind of unfolding, especially among more left-leaning and more secular Americans, as this next slide here um, suggests to us. So what we're seeing is that because left-leaning and secular Americans are more likely to prioritize individualism over family, work over parenthood, and progress over tradition, they become especially likely, especially since 2014, you know, the Great Awakening, to postpone or forego marriage and family life. The ideological gap, for instance, in the share of young women who are married is almost doubled um, from 2000 to 2000 and 2021. And the pattern among more progressive women is especially important because younger women have been turning to the left, obviously, in recent years. So this suggests that we can expect to see even more young adults turning away from marriage in the coming years because of sort of the you know, ideological tilt of young women in this country. Now, not only is this tragic given the tremendous current social and psychic value of marriage, it's especially tragic because the value of marriage, I think, is only gonna be growing in this country. And that's because the closing of the American heart will be especially painful in a century marked by the kind of widespread social breakdown that Scott Winship was chronicling uh, this morning that we'll be talking about more um, this afternoon. So um, that's sort of the big, I think, bad news uh, facing um, the country and facing young adults, especially um, in, in the coming years. All right, thank you, Brad. Uh, next up will be Bell Sahil. Uh, so it's great to be here. Um, thanks for having me, and I'm very uh, pleased that AEI is uh, under Scott's leadership, um, refreshing uh, the whole agenda around social capital. Uh, I do think it's very important, and I think it tends to get neglected. Uh, I've worked some on it myself, and uh, so I am uh, pleased to be here today, and I want to talk about some of the broader issues that came up in the first panel and will come up in this panel, but what I'm going to do right now in my very limited time is go through some sort of wonky slides that uh, might be of interest to you guys. So, whoops. Uh, oh, it's, yeah, okay. Uh, so the, uh, the, the first point here is that as our common sense uh, suggests, and as Brad has already said and has argued many, many times very articulately, marriage has lots of advantages for children in particular. Uh, it's more stable, 
uh, pro it provides more resources, both income and assets when there are two people in the family. Uh, it is more role, has more role models, more engagement by, by fathers, and it entails connections to a larger uh, kinship network and uh, other social supports. So the um, quote there is from my book on the family, which was called Generation Unbound and is about 10 or more years old now, but I think this quote still holds. And uh, it's not that there aren't bad marriages that are not good for children and that should split up. And it's not that there aren't single parents who are doing a great job. It's that on average, marriage is better for kids. And there's a whole, uh, you know, reams and reams of, re of research about that. Uh, Sarah, McClanahan, uh, Sarah McClanahan and I uh, once edited a whole volume on this with lots of academic papers, and I think they support this statement. But we know, I think, that this is still controversial amongst my progressive friends. There's a lot of argument nowadays that marriage is just one lifestyle and we shouldn't be uh, privileging it over any other lifestyle, including in our conversations about it. And I think this relates to what Brad was talking about when he said there's not only a class split in marriage these days, but also an ideological split. So we could come back to that. But I think what I want to show you right now is this wonky stuff that comes from what we call the social genome model, a model that I initially developed at Brookings, but is now a partnership with the Urban Institute and Child Trends. And it's a life cycle model of children's trajectories from birth to adulthood. And it shows all the stages along the way and how well their lives turn out and how their success in later life relates to um, their circumstances at birth and uh, other early experiences. So we know for these children whether their parents were married or not when they were born. By the way, this is a nationally representative sample uh, drawn from, the, uh, from two major data sets that are widely used and uh, respected amongst uh, scholars. And uh, the model has knit these data together to do this life cycle modeling. So what do we know if the children's uh, parents were married or not married when they were born? We can look at that with, uh, with the model. And um, this is what we get. Uh, the green bar on the right is uh, just one outcome that we look at in the model. I don't have time to go through all of them. And it is simply the individual's earnings at age 30. And so if I could read that from here, uh, it's about, what, 37,000 um, if, you, if your parents were married and about 26 if they weren't. That's the dark blue bar compared to the green bar. So then, as we know, and as Brad mentioned already, marriage is correlated with a whole lot of other things. It's correlated with the parents' education and income and so forth. So in the model, we can control for all of those things. And we can say, suppose the only thing we changed about this child at the time they were born is not their parents' income or education or the age of their mom when they were born or their health at birth, those kinds of things, holding all that constant and just marrying, getting them married um, increases their earnings at age 30. Not by a lot, but it does increase it. It increases about um, $2,000 uh, from about 26 to about 28,000. And that's about 7% of earnings at that level. So that's not you know, uh, unimportant. Uh, it's also not uh, huge. So a couple of other notable findings. Um, the biggest effects occur amongst um, uh, younger children uh, up to about age 14 or 15, and on some, uh, some of the behavioral measures in ad adolescence or early adolescence, like being uh, convicted of a crime or having lots of absences from school, 
you know, effects, effects as you might, surprise, might not be surprised to know, those things especially. Um, there's also, I have to tell you, a little wonky thing here, which is that there, Scott is smiling because he once worked on this model. Uh, there is a, like a seam in the data where we knit the two data sets together because we have to at about age 14, 15. So the later results may be actually um, conservative for that reason. In other words, they might be bigger if we could do a better job of knitting these two data sets together. But uh, the other big finding here, uh, again, not so surprising, is that when you, we look at this by race, which we do, uh, we actually run the model separately for black Americans, Hispanic Americans, and whites. The very biggest effects by far are for black Americans. And there's been a big debate in the research community uh, recently about whether black children are all that affected by single parenthood. And any, any individual black child may not be influenced that much, but when you factor in that such a large proportion of black children grow up outside of marriage, that leads to the result that the overall effects for black children are much greater. So um, I'm concluding that uh, children whose parents were married at the time they were born do do better in life uh, all through um, their childhood and early adulthood. And probably, um, you know, we could debate whether we got the numbers exactly right. I don't want to make a big case for it's exactly $2,000 because there are data and methodological issues here that I won't bore you with. But I think that um, uh, it's important to keep working on this and having good data on it. And I love all of the stuff that Brad says about the decline of the American heart. Uh, that's a wonderful phrase. I'll probably steal it from you the next time I have to give a talk. But I'm giving you some data to go along with it. So thank you very much. Thank you, Bell. Well, thank you, Bell. We'll, we'll turn it over to Ian, who I, I think you don't, no slides, right? No slides, but the, the precedent has been set for uh, speaking from the podium. Good morning. Um, you know, Kevin uh, described my uh, bio. I am a senior fellow at American Enterprise Institute, uh, but for the purpose of this discussion, I think I'll really focus on my role as a practitioner. Uh, for the last nearly 15 years, I've run public charter schools in the heart of the South Bronx and the Lower East Side of Manhattan, uh, working in communities that uh, are experiencing many of the downsides of some of the issues that we've uh, spoken about. And one of the great things that I love about Bob Woodson's work is that anytime you uh, are analyzing a lot of these problems or looking into communities, there's often an obsession with failure. You know, what is wrong with these communities? What's, you know, wh what, what are these people just, they're not, they're, they're not reading these stats <laughs> that are so evident. Uh, that marriage and other uh, strong mediating institutions can accrue to the community. But in any uh, community, uh, if you have non-marital birth rates, for example, where we just opened up our school, the non-marital birth rate is 84%, which is staggering. But Bob would say that is true, but that means at 16%, there's some group of families that things are functioning properly. What is it about that Group? Is there anything common? Is there anything to learn from even under the most adverse conditions that there are successes? And I think that's a, that's a, a very important way to think about these issues, which is that we have to be as uh, obsessed with success as we seemingly are often obsessed with failure. In my own experience uh, running public charter schools, you know, in the district in which um, we just launched uh, our, a virtues-based international baccalaureate high school. As I say, the non-marital birth rate is 84%. It's also a district in which only 7% of kids that start ninth grade four years later graduate from high school ready for college. You know, so these numbers are dismal. And yet, uh, in my experience, even in these uh, situations, you know, as I see, I've worked with thousands of young people from every kind of background, rich kids, poor kids, 
uh, 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 black kids, white kids, Hispanic kids, Asian kids, kids in foster care, uh, kids in homeless shelters. And what's been interesting is that as I've seen these young people make their own decisions as they enter young adulthood for themselves, the types of decisions that some young people make essentially recreate the disadvantage that they have lived, whether it be domestic violence, poverty, dysfunction, they've been on a hamster wheel of disadvantage. And yet I've seen other young people in those same exact conditions make different sets of decisions where they've been able to break the cycle of disadvantage. And the question is why? What makes the difference? Is it just completely random or their patterns, or in fact, the presence of strong mediating institutions. And that's certainly been my observation, that young people who've been able to break the cycle of disadvantage, putting themselves on a different trajectory, typically had some sense of personal agency, that they had a self-belief that they could lead a self-determined life. But this sense of personal agency didn't come from nowhere. It was really through the embrace of, in my observation, some key mediating institutions, in particular, family, religion, education, and then finally, entrepreneurship. And in family, the, the first um, major observation for young people who've broken the cycle of, cycle of disadvantage, they've come to the belief that regardless of the family that they were from, the family that they were on the pathway to form was going to be dramatically different. And the young people I've seen break the cycle of disadvantage have usually been on a pathway to follow what's typically called the success sequence, which probably many of the people in this room know. But that's data which says if you finish just your high school degree, at least your high school degree, then get a full-time job of any kind just so you learn the dignity and discipline of work. And if you have children, marriage first, 97% of millennials who follow that series of decisions avoid poverty and the vast majority enter the middle class or beyond. It's not 100% because there's no guarantees in life. And it must be said that if you're a child of a single parent, that doesn't mean you're, you're doomed to failure, nor if you're a child of a married two parent household are you guaranteed success. But as we can see from the data, it's, it's overwhelming. So it's one of the reasons we actually incorporate the teaching of the success sequence in our schools because young people don't necessarily have this perspective that these are the kinds of behaviors that will dramatically increase their likelihood for success. So the first observation is that young people who broke the cycle of disadvantage recognize that the most consequential decision that they can make as a human being was to bring another human being into the world and that there were different pathways that gave them as well as their future children greater chances of success. The second observation, or the second mediating institution that I've seen for uh, young people who broke the cycle of disadvantage is that they typically had some kind of personal faith commitment, usually born out of a religious institution. Regardless if it was Christianity or Buddhism, they lived by a moral code that emanated from that religious affiliation. So that moral framework became almost a bedrock for making these kinds of complex decisions that young people start to face uh, as they start to enter young adulthood. And what's also interesting is that not only did they have a personal faith commitment, they were part of a community of people, whether it be going to church every Sunday, but they were part of a community of people who expected them to live up to that moral code. So that's another observation, again, another mediating institution. The third observation I've certainly seen over my years, uh, in terms of education, young people who've been able to break the cycle of disadvantage have had the benefit of educational freedom or school choice, whether it be a charter school, a parent who moved uh, to find an apartment in a, in a wealthy suburb so their kid could go to a great uh, public uh, school. That is part of the equation. So oftentimes when we're talking about things like marriage, uh, it, there are other entities, other uh, mediating institutions that we also have to strengthen to have the byproduct put young people on a different trajectory. And then finally, if a young person is on 
Regardless of the family that they're from, they're on the pathway to form a different family. If they have a personal faith commitment, if they've benefited from educational freedom, that usually has led to what I call the last E in my free framework, entrepreneurship. And entrepreneurship is, is what I describe as, it can include certainly starting a business and working, but it's primarily this idea that you have an overcomer's mindset, that regardless of the challenges that you face, the strength of the three institutions that you've now been part of, family, religion, and education, have given you almost a, what I call a bedrock of being able to know that you have confidence to overcome challenges when they inevitably come. So this focus on mediating institutions, I think, is crucial. Um, it is part of the story of success that is typically found in communities where we're usually just talking about the failures, but we're ignoring the very ingredients that are empowering the very people that live in these communities to succeed. Uh, well, thank you, Ian, and thank you to all of our panelists. I will now lead a, a discussion of some of the issues we've been hearing about. I will say I was a little bit both fascinated and depressed um, after our first panel um, on some of the historical trends we've seen in, in social capital. And I think we have started the same, this panel with some of the same disappointing um, trends. Uh, the closing of the American heart, um, the implications of that for economic outcomes of kids, um, although that maybe there's a glimmer of hope. And thank you, Ian, for bringing that light to the panel as well. Um, you know, there is probably less policy focus on social capital as a whole, but I think there's extreme interest on issues of, of the family, uh, both um, in terms of what are the causes of some of the decline in marriage and especially fertility, um, and intense policy focus or interest on ways to, to deal with it, which I think makes this a really ripe discussion for what we can do about it. Um, so I have three basic areas of questioning that I'd like each of, each of you to, to, just, to um, opine on. Um, first is really on underlying causes. Second, on um, whether the trends we've seen are good or bad. I think bad, but let's, let's discuss it. Um, and then especially policies that we can uh, implement to address some of these issues. Um, so, so the first question is on you know, what are the underlying causes of the, the trends that we've seen in both marriage and fertility, um, and you know, what do you think about some of the claims out there that this is largely due to a rise in the cost of uh, raising children? Um, and I'll start here with, uh, with Brad, and then we'll, we'll move down, down the line. So in terms of you know, why we're seeing this, um, you know, what I call closing of the American heart and fold when it comes to, to marriage um, and to some extent fertility as well. I mean, I think certainly economics is part and parcel of, that, of the answer to that question, the way in which um, I think, particularly for people living in metropolitan areas, you know, costs related to housing and education and, and childcare um, have, have grown um, a great deal. And also kind of the opportunity costs that we've seen play out too, where, you know, if you have two, uh, you know, folks who are married um, when it comes to childbearing, um, and then you have kids, you're going to lose access often to kind of the full um, engage with the labor force of often the mom, um, although sometimes the dad these days as well. And so there's a big opportunity cost to pay. So there's certainly an economic part of this, particularly I think for people living in more expensive regions like the DC metro area. So that's, that's part and parcel of what's happened as well, as well as too as the shift from a kind of more industrial economy to a post-industrial economy that is less likely to sort of supply high paying, stable jobs to, uh, to men that would make them more attractive as um, as husbands and breadwinners. Um, so that's also part of the economic story. But there's also obviously a cultural story um, where we're seeing, as Scott has pointed out before, we're seeing kind of, um, we're living in an increasingly affluent society that makes a kind of more individualistic mindset, I think, more appealing and more attractive um, to a lot of folks. Um, that's also, I think, linked to more secularization and to a range of kind of uh, broader cultural movements that are less likely to kind of embrace the classic virtues and values that sustain strong and stable families. That's, I think, part of the, the story. But it's also important to note here, too, that, and I would say, unfortunately, a lot of the key actors um, who control the commanding heights of our culture in, in the media, in the academy, um, in, you know, in, in Southern California, 
are kind of making decisions and offering messages that are not particularly conducive to um, you know, marriage and strong families. Um, and so whether you look at, you know, a platform like Netflix or, you know, look at, um, you know, Warner Music or you look at what the New York Times tends to say about um, education, um, you just you get a variety of different messages that are either explicitly or implicitly kind of communicated to the public that marriage is not that important or is, you know, is not important at all. Um, and that we need not kind of embrace the kinds of virtues that would sustain strong families. So that's also, I think, part of the cultural story there. And then in terms of the policy um, part of this conversation, I think um, we had Richard Reeves um, debating Ian last week at UVA, and he was kind of making the argument that just because we don't see much evidence that uh, President Bush's Healthy Marriage Initiative really turned the dial when it came to marriage and family, that public policy really doesn't impact marriage. Um, and I think if you kind of look to a much broader range of evidence, um, Richard's claim is actually not true. Um, and so I'm thinking in particular of uh, two different sort of sets of uh, federal policy um, that have impacted marriage. So one is um, the military. And we don't actually have good, you know, up-to-date evidence. So I'd like to see actually someone, and maybe we'll figure out a way to commission this, but we have some evidence from about 10 years ago showing us that when you look at Americans who are enlisted in the military, they're much more likely to be married compared to their civilian equivalents in terms of race or you know, education or other kinds of factors. Um, and that in fact in the military, it's the one place in America where there's no racial gap in marriage. Okay, that's pretty striking, right? And so what does the military have, right? Well, it has an expectation. You're not gonna get any benefits when it comes to housing and healthcare and other kinds of things if you're cohabiting. You've gotta be married, okay? So when in fact we're very explicit about kind of valuing marriage over cohabitation in federal policy in this one domain of our world, we see very large marriage effects. And Richard, you know, so he's wrong to say that we don't have any evidence that, that federal policy is linked to marriage. Um, and then I think secondly, and obviously there's a debate about this, but secondly, I think we've seen since the 1960s in a variety of ways that sort of means-tested policies and programs have penalized marriage and have made kind of male breadwinners for families often functionally either irrelevant or, or less necessary. Um, and so the way in which we've unintentionally structured many of our programs um, has, you know, basically made marriage less you know, economically valuable for working class and poor couples and families. And that's another reason why you know marriage is down. So if we could think about reforming those programs and policies, I know it'd be expensive um, to clearly signal that if you're going to get married, you know, and you're working class couple with kids, you're not going to lose access to Medicaid. You're not going to lose access to childcare subsidies. You're not going to lose access to um, you know to food stamps, for instance. And I would say particularly when you've got younger kids in the household, that would be potentially a helpful way of at least kind of making the the federal government less of a um, a drag when it comes to um, you know marriage, especially in more working class and poor communities and contexts. Thank you, Brad. And so, Bell, what do you think in terms of focusing now on just the causes of these declines in marriage and fertility? How do you distinguish between economic and cultural factors, and, and even some of the policy factors that Brad discussed? And I know we we will get to some more focus on the uh, policy the policy solutions um, later as well. Uh, right, I. Um uh, I, to some extent, agree with Brad. I certainly agree that those are the factors that should be on the table for discussion here, economics, culture, and policy. Uh, I would put culture at the very top of the list, and I would say it's much more important than economics, and both culture and economics are more important than policy, if I had to rank them. Now, I should you know, say a little bit more. Um, on the cultural front, in addition to what Brad said as examples there, I like to tell people, because I'm old, that I can remember, I can literally remember a day when um, if you were living with another adult and you weren't married to them, you were, it was said you were living in sin. If you had a child outside of marriage, that child was called an illegitimate child. We actually used those terms up until a few decades ago. Um, and uh, if you were a woman and you had sex before marriage, and it was known that you were having sex before marriage, 
You were called a loose woman. Now, you know, none of those, and those were very standard phrases. So it's my way of sort of bringing home in a simple way how important the shift in social norms and culture uh, has been. Uh, on the economic front, I think um, the most important thing that's happened there is that women are now well-educated, they're able to earn a good living, they are much less dependent on marriage uh, for their income. Uh, the women who are getting married nowadays are mainly well-educated women who are doing quite well economically. They don't need marriage for economic reasons. They're doing it for other reasons, such as you know having two parents to raise children, et cetera. And um, so I think that's the biggie there. there. I think there's a little bit of truth to the fact that men are not doing as well, particularly working class men. Their real earnings really have uh, not gone up and they're dropping out of the labor force. So if you're a working class woman uh, and you're looking around for a mate, uh, you're not seeing a lot of great uh, prospects. Um, uh, so I don't, maybe, maybe you don't want me to go into causes of fertility and policy right now and give Ian a chance. Yeah, let's bring Ian in and then we'll come right back to that. Yeah, okay. Um, so see, Ian, Ian, what would you say to this? Uh, well, I, I, I found, uh, Bell, you reminiscing about, about the good old days. Um, <laughs> Maybe they weren't quite so good old, but... Well, uh, well, the reason I say it is that, I, you know, I live in a small town in Westchester, and uh, everybody's married. You know, uh, kids are generally being raised in married two-parent households. They're, the, the things that you just described, if someone uh, were to have a child outside of marriage in this community, it would be looked upon with shame, something that we don't really talk about. And that's not uncommon in a lot of middle to upper class communities across the country. So this, this sort of closing of the American heart, I, that's one of those things, it's a framing um, that obviously is, is, applies to a, a segment of our society. But there is a segment of our country that is thriving, strong marriages, low divorce rates, uh, strong educational outcomes. So I, as someone who runs schools, am constantly thinking, okay, it's not as if people who are in low-income communities don't have the capacity to live in the same way. What are the structures we need to put in place and the environments that we need to create for kids that they can have the same kinds of assumptions that the kids who are growing up where I grew up that they're going to be married, it's, it's like they know the life script, right? But there's no reason that the kids in, our, in other communities can't know that as well. We just have to have deliberate approaches to make that happen. So, you know, for example, you know, again, I talk about the success sequence. Well, how can we remove the obstacles that make it so hard for someone to start on that path? You know, in, in this district where we just launched uh, Vertex Partnership Academies, I mentioned only 7% of kids graduate from high school ready for college. Well, in this district, there's a cap, actually throughout New York City, there's a cap on charter schools, right? So if the first rung is to even just finish your uh, high school degree, if you're um, raised in that uh, community and someone wanted to launch a great school to help you achieve, there's a legislative barrier to do that. So I think it's, uh, just recognizing that marriage is not dead, like all these trends are trends that are particularly focused in certain communities, but it's clear it's accessible to everyone. So how do we remove the obstacles to make it so that people, particularly in low-income communities, can gain access? And I think we, we can positively approach that versus constantly focusing on the, the declines in those communities. Yeah, th thank you, and so, uh, so I think we all couldn't help but start to get into some of the policy solutions. So I, I think we all agree that these trends are, are bad. We don't want to see declines in marriage or fertility. So we'll take that as- I actually disagree okay. on the fertility front. You want to raise the amount of time and resources devoted to each child, which I think is important. Now, if we're worried about the fact that we don't have enough children to pay for our Social Security and Medicare, that's another issue or to fight wars, or to keep the GDP growing. Uh, first of all, it will keep, the, if we have fewer children, it will keep GDP per capita growing, which I think is more important than overall GDP. 
But, you know, if we need more workers or nor more people to support us in our old age, we know how to do that. It's called immigration. And that brings up a whole host of other issues. But in my view, that is the way we should solve that problem. Okay, so I'll, I'll let Ian or, or Brad jump in if, if they have any other, other viewpoints. No, I mean, my only point, fertility, it's as long as the kids are... Um, born within marriage. <laughs> I think that's that for me, that's the most important uh, indicator. Yeah, that's I mean, it's a, a, a important, I think, point that Bella is raising here in terms of like, how do we think about, you know, fertility? Um, and obviously, there are, I think, going to be major economic consequences playing out. Um, we're already seeing this, obviously, in Japan. Um, we're going to see it in, in China and Taiwan and Hong Kong. Um, and Singapore very soon now as well, because and South Korea is just through the floor. Um, you know, with less than one child per woman on average in South Korea. I think, I, with all respect to you, Bell, I think I think what folks may not recognize and appreciate is if you really take the view that Bell is articulating now, um, and you let it out in the culture, um, you're just going to see this kind of you know amazingly um, negative trend in in childbearing. I mean, it's no. I, we have a very large family. There are many sacrifices that one has to sort of make when you have lots of kids. Um, and people, I think, are very aware today of all the sacrifices that attend to being a parent, being a, being a father, and, and in some ways, obviously, being a mother even more so. But I think they don't much appreciate, though, are all the, all the benefits that flow from being a parent. Um, putting aside, again, the GDP and, and all that. I mean, I'll just give you kind of one non-empirical example, just one anecdotal example. So I'm driving my kids to Catholic school in the morning, you know, a couple of months ago, and I'm voice texting an email to, you know, to my wife on the ride over to the school with the kids in the back, in the back seat, and I'm saying something about, I don't know, you know, groceries or something like that. And at the end of, of my text, my youngest son, who's nine years old, jumps in and says, I love you, I love you, I love you, to my wife, you know, who's the recipient of this text. So here you have a 52-year-old woman kind of starting off her day, you know, at, at work, um, and she's getting this text from her husband that begins with kind of the boring, you know, things we've got to do, take care of, et cetera, and then it ends for her with, I love you, I love you, I love you. And she knows, unfortunately, <laughs> that it's not from her husband. <laughs> it's from her youngest child, um, who is still completely enamored with her. So... I just think there's a there's just something as you are too as I am too, but it just we're a, we're a little more seasoned in our relationship. Um, Come on, Brad. So uh, yes, um, so I'm just saying there's just I'm sorry. I'm like you know, I, I love my kids and they can be extremely challenging and, and hard. But, and your wife. Um, and I love my wife. Yes, <laughs> but there's just something amazing I think about kids that is I think in this current cultural context, particularly in more elite contexts like this one and UVA sometimes as well, they don't fully appreciate kind of the value that children bring into our lives and just the wonder and the joy and the, the novelty and, 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 and that sort of expression of unmerited love in some ways, or merited love too as well. So that's sort of, I think, my more personal response to, to so, both. So can I just add to that by saying that I hate to talk about money when you've been talking about love. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I hope we all know which is more important, but uh, I don't think we can avoid the fact that children cost a ton these days. And I was really surprised when the Wall Street Journal um, reached out to me uh, a few months ago and said, we're trying to figure out how much it costs to raise children, to raise a child in the United States right now. And I said, well, you need to go to the U.S. Department of Agriculture because they put out those estimates on a regular basis. Well, it turned out that they hadn't put out uh, an estimate for quite some time, and they were still using an inflation rate of 2%, which we now know is not accurate moving forward. So uh, I did some new estimates for them. And oh my god, what I was amazed by is the number of media outlets that picked up on that. Um, and um, I was out in Colorado, and I was trying to, well, I, I won't go on and on, but I mean, there was huge media interest in this. And I think it's because younger people thinking about family life and kids are trying to figure out whether they can afford it. And what does the estimate show for a typical married family with two kids? What does one child cost from birth to age 17? The answer is 
$310,000. Now, that is just for, you know, housing, food, childcare, et cetera, uh, does not include higher education. If you include higher education, you know you have to add quite a lot to that. So if you're thinking of having, you know, three or four kids, that's a lot. There are some economies of scale, but that's a lot of money. And um, how are you going to afford that? on a middle class income and, and, and how are you gonna afford it unless both of you are working? And if both of you are working and you add on the childcare expenses, which are next to housing, the, the, the second highest expense for working families with kids, um, then you're in trouble. Well, that's, and that, again, that's why renormalizing children within marriage I think is so powerful because typically people who are married are planning and they will figure out the answers to that question as to whether or not they should have zero, one, two, four. But the idea is that the child doesn't just show up. There's, there are two people who bonded to each other first who've made a decision that this is the family that we want, whatever is appropriate for that particular couple. Yeah. Uh, at, uh, Brad, do you want to say one more thing? So I think this just kind of does sort of move us into the policy discussion. It's a good point that Bell's making about kind of the costs of kids and also the opportunity costs of kids today um, as well, because, you know, it usually means going from, in some cases, you know, two full-time workers to one part-time worker and one full-time worker or one, one parent at home as well, and that increases the opportunity cost. So I think thinking about kind of ways that we can kind of make family life more affordable for working and middle-class families in terms of coming back to the child tax credit, you know, the Romney 2.0, for instance, is one way of doing that, obviously. But also think about these other costs that Bella's mentioned in terms of things like education. So this is one, one reason, for instance, I think conservatives should be extremely kind of supportive of ESAs that are rolling out across states in the U.S. because it gives parents more choices when it comes to sort of where they send their kids to school and it makes private schooling uh, much more affordable for working middle class families than it was even say 10 years ago. Um, and then also thinking to obviously down the road about reforming higher education in ways that would sort of rein in you know a lot of the costs that have become excessively um, you know high when it comes to higher education. Um, and then thinking across partisan lines too on you know things like housing reform. Are there ways that we can kind of take a place like Los Angeles and really rethink you know zoning and regulations to um, you know to make housing in a place like LA um, much more affordable than it currently is, or in places around DC as well. So there are a variety of things that we have to do on a policy front to make um, parenthood more affordable. And I think Bell is correct to sort of note the problem. And to also note that in this current context, having kids in metropolitan areas in the U.S. is extremely difficult given the opportunity costs and, and the real costs of parenthood. So that's certainly a legitimate concern. So, so Bellanine, I'll let you each, um, any other policy, especially well, yes, solution I want, I want to pick up on questions. something that Ian said that I think is really important. He said one of the reasons that he likes marriage is because if you marry before you have children, then the process of having kids is much more likely to be a thoughtful, planned um, uh, activity that you've done with another adult and you've made a commitment to each other as well as to the children. And so many of the children who are born to younger uh, women who are not married are unplanned. I mean, in fact, um, about 70% of those births are unplanned. And uh, we should be sympathetic and empathetic when that happens. But if we want children uh, not to, to come into the world with the commitment from adults that they need, and both their mother and their father, uh, we have to worry about planning, which means uh, we have to have the availability of birth control. And I, of course, am in favor of choice where abortion is concerned. We don't need to get into that. I know that that's not probably a popular view in this room. But I just want to go on the record that I do think it's important. But, you know, basic idea here, uh, accidents happen. A child shouldn't be one of them. Uh, Ian, I'll let you have the final words, and we'll go to um, a question after well, that. Well, I'll just, I'll just stay in the realm of education. Uh, again, for so much of this discussion, we're talking about the difference in class or college educated. You know, one of the things I think we have to recognize that the college for all mentality particularly in secondary education, hasn't necessarily 
helped our nation, that there are lots of professions that don't require uh, a college degree that are worthy of respect and dignity and certainly uh, have the capacity to earn a very good living. So from a policy perspective, A, just the whole idea of choice, educational freedom is really important, but also hopefully a transformative opportunity in secondary education in high school. Our, our, the school that we've just launched in the Bronx will give young people at the end of their sophomore year the choice as to whether or not to pursue the International Baccalaureate Diploma Program, which is a traditional college, very rigorous, or they can choose the International Baccalaureate Careers Pathway, where they'll be able to do apprenticeships in high school in phlebotomy, computer science, real estate, with the idea that they can earn a credential at the end of high school with labor market value. And there's tons of research that shows that young people who actually uh, work, especially with these kinds of credentials, right out of high school, particularly boys, much less likely to have ch children outside of marriage, uh, greater sense of personal agency. So those are some of the, I think, um, policy initiatives that at least would open up the education prism to, again, put young people on, starting on a pathway that they can see a different future for themselves, which would include responsible parenthood and marriage. All right, thank you. I think we had one question I saw in the back right, and that's probably all we have time for. Uh, thank you. Uh, Tim Carney, and just trying to tie together Brad's idea of the closing of the American heart, some of the cultural shifts we were talking about in the beginning, and then uh, where Bell brought it um, with the importance of preventing unwanted pregnancies. Uh, the writer Stephanie Murray has a line that she said, um, because Parenthood has become a personal choice. It's become a personal problem. And this was her way of explaining why so many people just say, have as many as you want, just make sure you take care of them on your own. And the sort of society's withdrawal from helping people raise kids. And you see it again, and I see journalists constantly say, Mother's Day is coming up. Mother's Day is not, and it's one day to make up for the fact that we're raising kids without societal support. So much of societal support is obviously going to come from culture, from community, from the, the institutions we were talking about in the, in the first part. Maybe some of our societal support has retreated from parents. Maybe parents are left more alone than they otherwise would be precisely because of the mindset that's happened over the last 60 years um, that having a child isn't the thing you do, which it used to be back in the old days, if you remember. It's now something some people choose. Like some people choose to buy a boat. And the boat's their problem. So I wonder if you worry about that cultural shift that we're leaving parents and saying, well, you chose to be a parent, that's on your own. And that's why so many parents feel so left alone. And that actually makes par parenting more expensive than it otherwise would be if you had the community, the social safety net that is civil society. Well, there's no question that um that, 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 that ethos has shifted in the way that you explained, uh, Tim. And there's no question that the US does far less than other c rich countries in Europe, for example, to support parenthood and children. Um, and they have much bigger safety nets for families. And we have low taxes and a more um, constrained safety net by far. So I think one of the things that I hear some of my conservative friends talking about now in the context of preventing um, unwanted births and worrying that we may have more of them now because of what's been happening recently in the, at the court level, um, that maybe it's time to have a more uh, cross-partisan conversation about supports for children like the child tax credit like child care, like paid leave. Um, in um, my last book with Richard Reeves, we called for 20 days of paid leave every year for everyone, not just for parents, but parents would clearly benefit. Now, 20 days of paid leave sounds like a lot, but I'm here to tell you that when we did research on this, and it really surprised me, that's what you find in Europe. They, they organize it around holidays, mandated holidays. They have so many more than we do. And in the context of a divided America, and I think the desire that many of us have to encourage more, more unifying, 
uh, life in America, one way to do it would be to not only provide this paid leave so people could do more volunteer work if they didn't have kids, be better parents if they were kids, and name the holidays after historical figures like we've already done with, you know, George Washington or July 4th or Thanksgiving or whatever, uh, Martin Luther King, and um, make that a new way of trying to bring America together around the idea of we're one community, we have a history we can be proud of, plenty of work to do, and we have a future uh, that is bright if we all come together around community and the idea of community. So just wanted to throw that idea out there because I've been mulling around with it recently. Love to have some comments on it. And we do need to wrap up momentarily. Ian and Brad, if you had uh, any very quick final remarks, that would be fine. Otherwise, we'll, we'll move on to the next panel. I, I, I mean, I actually love that idea that you've just articulated, Bell, so I'm, I want to say that. But I do, I do think that Tim is really kind of underlying an important cultural point, and that is that if we don't kind of sort of see family and parenthood as kind of a positive, intrinsic good, um, I think we're going to see a lot less of that, and it's going to be harder for people to navigate, you know, parenthood in, in airplanes and, and their local communities, you know, restaurants, coffee shops, et cetera. And it's just going <laughs> to, the pace of, of or the, uh, the, the sort of falling fertility rate is going to just keep going down. And I think that's going to be not just problematic for our economy and, you know, for the military's ability to, rec you know, recruit. But I, I think it's going to be a, um, a loss for the, the, uh, the human experience as well. Yeah, and I would just add, from a cultural perspective, Tim, you're absolutely right. It's The onus is on those of us who have strong families, have strong marriages, to do what we often say, which is to preach what we practice in our own lives and to say why, right? The benefit, the joy of, of having children, experiencing children, everything that that um, connotes. And, and you know, there's also the Harvard longe uh, Longevity Project that also overwhelmingly says relationships are the most important, most notably marriage. So preach what we practice. All right, well, thank you all um, for, the, for the panel. Um, uh, we'll have a short 10-minute break, and we'll be meeting back here at, at noon. Thank you.
Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Robert Doerr, the president of AEI, and it's my great honor to welcome Senator Mike Lee here to with us today. Senator Lee has represented Utah in the Senate since 2011. He has served as the vice chair, chairman, and now ranking member of the Joint Economic Committee. He joins us today as one of the Senate's leading advocates for Americans who have suffered from our country's decline in social capital. He understands, as no other politician does, that the decline in social capital, not high levels of poverty, is the real crisis among struggling Americans. The decline encompasses many challenges, including the retreat from marriage, growing detachment from the labor force, the splintering of civil society welfare dependency, work and marriage disincentives, and other government barriers to opportunity and employment compound the decline. These are problems that trouble social scientists and poverty researchers like myself and my colleagues, but unfortunately these problems have not been handled with the attention and urgency they deserve. Meanwhile, all Americans, and especially those with low incomes and low levels of education, suffer the consequences. But Senator Lee has made American social capital a priority for the JEC and for federal policymaking. While serving as vice chair of the JEC in 2017, Senator Lee launched the Social Capital Project to devote some of the committee's resources towards studying these challenges and devising a policy agenda to tackle them. The Social Capital Project grew during Senator Lee's time as chair of the JEC from 2019 to 2021 and it continues today in his office as ranking member of the committee. It's also worth noting the Social Capital Project staff has included current AEI scholars, namely Scott Winship and Kevin Corinth, who now lead the Center on Opportunity and Social Mobility. And the Center carries on the work that, that I began as head of the Poverty Studies Program in 2014, and the work that Scott and Kevin did under Senator Lee in the JEC. We hope the Senator's research supplements the work of Senator Lee's Social Capital Project and helps legislatures like Senator Lee champion the policies Americans need to form strong communities and excel. For all of those reasons, I am very glad and proud to welcome Senator Lee to the stage. Thanks very much. Thanks so much, Kevin, and thanks to all of you for being here. It really is great to be back at AEI. I enjoy visiting this place for all sorts of reasons. Um, and it goes back about a quarter of a century. My friend Joe Cannon used to be on the board of AEI when I was a young lawyer in private practice here in Washington. He would invite me to events, and I realized right up front these people are smart and have good speakers and good discussions and promote conversations that need to happen but too often don't. So thank you for doing what you do. Um, I've, I've had a number of staff members over the years, some of my very favorite staff members, including Scott Winship and Kevin Corinth, and a couple of others, including Kate Cannon and uh, Jillian Wheeler, who uh, end up getting um, hired by uh, AEI. And so I did uh, travel here today with three of my staff members, and I hope to be able to leave the building with them <laughs> still. Uh, nonetheless, I'm, I'm uh, very um, honored uh, to be here with, with both Scott and Kevin. Um, uh, who did such amazing work uh, running the Social Capital Project. Uh, Scott uh, was with us from the beginning and, and launched this thing, and, and, um, and Kevin continued his great work. And so I'm glad to know that they are here, the best place, the best organization that can host this that is outside the Republican uh, uh, Joint Economic Committee staff. All right, we're gonna go through a little exercise. I want you to raise your hand if you've heard the following question or some version of it lately. What happened to this country? Anybody heard that? I hear that from time to time. Sometimes I hear it in my own head, but I certainly hear it from lots of others. We wonder sometimes whether we recognize ourselves, ourselves collectively as a country. It's a sentiment that's becoming somewhat ubiquitous among so many Americans. Um, in, in, in our culture today, which is kind of a culture that, um, as it manifests itself in the news media establishment, uh, goes by the mantra of, if it bleeds, it leads. And in that world, we can't sometimes help the feeling that um, 
we've lost something as a society, as a country, and as a culture. And as we surf the channels or as we look on social media, we're exposed to no shortage of punditry about um, how some specific heavy-handed government solution is necessary uh, to, to whatever predicament ails us at the moment. You know, sometimes uh, when somebody violates a law in this country, or more often 12 laws simultaneously, the immediate reaction is, we need to pass yet another law. And sometimes you see this in the form of calls for new aggressive consumer protection laws or even a new consumer protection, protection agency when some sort of a corporate scandal has occurred. Or calls for aggressive mandates during a pandemic, demands for uh, defunding the police or uh, getting rid of qualified immunity or some other massive overhaul of law enforcement following an incidence of police brutality. Um, uh, demands for aggressive modifications to the way guns are treated under our laws following a shooting. But it's not always the tangible things that pose the greatest threats to society, or they are manifestations of threats that are upstream from that. And it's to those threats that I, I want to direct my attention today. Now, thanks to the years of amazing work by organizations like AEI, and the Joint Economic Committee, and, and, and people like Kevin Corinth and Scott Winship, who have um, pushed this movement forward in both capacities. We're learning that these intangible associations and social connections are vital to any flourishing society. And that when those things start to erode, everything else becomes more problematic. Over the years, our, our nation has, of course, faced no real shortage of challenges, of serious challenges. But one thing that has remained consistent is the significance of social capital in mitigating these challenges and helping people achieve upward mobility, not just in spite of, but uh, often in the direct face of, and sometimes propelled by these same challenges. While the concept of social capital may seem abstract, it's something that we all experience. And it's something that in the past has been difficult to measure, so it hasn't been measured. In many cases, we haven't even thought to measure it. And that's one of the principal goals that we had when starting this social capital project, is to identify what we're not measuring that we reasonably could and should be measuring and evaluating what we can do about what the data set will tell us. It's the networks. It's the norms. It's the trust. It's necessary to facilitate cooperation and coordination among individuals and among institutions. It's something that allows us to work together and to solve problems, to build strong families, neighborhoods, communities. It's something that we have to work together to strengthen, and it's something that we have to commit to understand further. And I have a sense that we're really just at the tip of the iceberg of all there is to know about social capital. Now, you may have felt a lot of this intuitively. Now, what was once a hunch is now affirmed by a mounting body of research and data. For example, thanks to the Social Capital Project, we're now better equipped to examine the impact of marriage and family stability on social and economic mobility. The JEC Social Capital Index data shows that individuals who grew up in stable two-parent households have a much higher chance of success in education, employment, income and success in their family relationships. Stable families provide a nurturing environment, and that's one that supports the development of children while teaching essential values like self-control and responsibility and hard work. But there is the unfortunate reality that we face every day that the stability of families is declining in America, and it's not declining evenly. It's declining with excessive speed and force among non-college educated families. And as you move up the socioeconomic scale, the education scale, uh, it's stronger relative uh, uh, to others, uh, lower on the scale. And this trend is in turn causing an increase in poverty rates and reduced social mobility resulting in greater disparities 
of income, wealth, educational opportunities, and so many other things that tend to contribute to human flourishing. But we can't keep the secret to ourselves. As a nation, we've got to recognize that strong and stable families are the fundamental building blocks. In fact, they are the without which not building blocks, the sine qua non of a thriving economy and any environment in which human flourishing is a possibility, in which upward economic mobility can be a thing. Rates of divorce, single parenthood, and cohabitation are higher among lower income and less educated Americans. And so this divide in family stability is contributing to the growing opportunity gap in our society. Now, I'm not going to be that prototypical politician. And I, I, I don't love the term politician because it conjures up images of the, the root Greek roots of the word politics, uh, poly, which means many, and ticks, which are blood-sucking parasites. But uh, <laughs> I'll call myself an emissary of, of the state of Utah. I'm not going to be that, that prototypical emissary of the state of Utah or of any other state who's just going to brag about his state, except that I kind of can't really avoid it here. Because Utah has consistently ranked high in terms of social capital, including strong families, civic engagement, and later labor force participation. And in fact, a, a recent report out just this week from, from US News ranked Utah as the best state in America, undoubtedly attributable to high levels of social capital throughout the state, and uh, uh, notwithstanding uh, uh, the, the, the imperfections of that state's senator. Uh, Utah does really well in this area, and it has one of the highest marriage rates in the country and a culture that values family and interpersonal relationships. It's got a sense of community, and people are actively involved in their neighborhoods and their civic organizations. Our high social capital index significantly affects the, the state's economic success and its overall well-being. And so it's not just the index that matters, it's the things that flow from it. And the things that flow from it uh, emphasize the central premise behind the social capital project. Now, none of this, of course, of course occurs in a vacuum. Um, there are some things that have facilitated it. As Utahns, we have a strong relationship with faith. And by this, I don't just mean the, the faith that is predominant within the state, uh, uh, w which I share. Uh, People of all faiths, uh, uh, those who do have it in Utah, tend to be very engaged with their own religious community and their own faith tradition. And that does make a difference. As we know that regular churchgoers have a higher rate of civic engagement, of volunteerism, and of charitable giving, uh, which are all crucial to any thriving community. Religious institutions provide a sense of community and belonging that can help people to overcome challenges of poverty and social isolation. And they do so, moreover, in an environment where it's really just pure social capital engagement. It, you're not there because you're getting paid for it, because most of the time you're paying to be there through your tithes and your offerings. You're doing that because you can and because you want to interact with people and because your faith drives you to interact with people. Your faith gives to you an understanding that you can't fully practice your faith in isolation as an atomized unit. It has to be in association with others. Now, as much as I have a, uh, an interest in preserving Utah's uh, a place as the best state in the nation. And I, I, I love the fact that they put that. When I first saw the headline, I was incredulous. I thought that surely they must have meant uh, the best place in the nation to consume jello or the best place in the nation to go skiing, which it undoubtedly is. It, it wasn't qualified. It's just the best state in the nation. So hats off to the good folks at US News. But the truth is the country would benefit uh, uh, by promoting some of the same social values that have helped contributed, uh, that have helped to contribute to Utah's success in this area. It's not uh, a, a mystery. Now, getting there is difficult, but it is important to recognize what happens here. And it's important to recognize that social capital doesn't just happen automatically, spontaneously. And it doesn't just happen because one or two people happens to will it to occur. It requires deliberate effort. Uh, uh, on the part of individuals, 
and organizations, but it all has to start at the individual level because without the individual, you can't have the engagement with an organization, with other individuals there. It's unique and we cannot and must never rely on the government, certainly not the government alone, to build it. It's all up to us to take action and to strengthen the bonds that unite us. And so we need to come together as a society and invest in our communities, our schools, our houses of worship, and our other civic institutions. I want to be clear on this point. When you hear the word invest in this town, it means something different in New York and, well, in, in most other cities in the entire world. But in this town, when you utter the word invest, especially if you uh, are in the world of politics, typically that means something. In this town, that always means federal funding sometimes direct federal funding, sometimes federal funding to be doled out in the form of block grants, uh, and sometimes it means federal funding to go toward a new bureaucracy, but it always involves uh, spending U.S. taxpayer dollars in some way or another. This is not the kind of investment that I'm talking about here, because we have to be very careful and remember the fact that government, least of all the federal government, but government in general, cannot create social capital any more that, than it can create social connectedness, or free markets, or families, or institutions of civil society. All those things are essential to our prosperity as a society and as indiv individuals. But government can't create them. And I've seen what happens when government tries to create them, when it tries to manage them, when it tries to direct them. It always ends in tears and often worse than that. And so that's not the kind of investment that I'm talking about here. Government can't create those things, but it can weaken them. That's why the whole point of the social capital project from the beginning, or one of its objectives, was that as we measure social capital and figure out what role it plays, it's our job to be on the lookout for ways in which government weakens social capital, is eroding institutions of civil society, and causing things to fray. That's where we can in this town, in this government, that's the best thing we can do because we happen to be the biggest single source of weakening of social capital uh, in terms of entities outside of organized drug cartels or organized crime rings. Uh, we intend much better than the drug cartels, but we sometimes inflict great havoc on society. We have to recognize that we are all in this together and that we're all interconnected. We can't thrive as a nation if we don't invest in the social capital that underpins our success. So let me just leave you with, with this. Social capital isn't just an ab abstract concept or a buzzword. It's a fundamental building block of our society. It's what enables us to achieve great things together and to solve problems, build businesses and raise families and pursue our dreams. This is something that each and every one of us has a role to promote. And I challenge everyone within earshot that one of the most patriotic things you can do is to be a better neighbor, to treat someone with compassion, and to strengthen your community. These things uh, we know from an abundant body of psychological research really does have an accelerating effect. It produces waves, positive vibes, as uh, my daughter might say, uh, that will end up having favorable impacts far beyond our notice. As Americans, we do have a choice in this. We can continue down a path of social capital decline, or we can take action to reverse it. We can invest in our families, in our communities, in our country. We can prioritize relationships over screens, service over self-interest, and values over virtue signaling. What we faced starting in the early months of 2020 is instructive in this regard. In a sense, we had two pandemics that began in 2020. The first was the virus itself, but the second was the government response to the virus. In many respects, I think that history will prove that the more deadly was the second, not the first. Because all of a sudden we had a government, a very powerful government that made itself even bigger, even more powerful, putting even more federal funding to quote unquote invest in people. But in, in so doing, in the way it went about it, 
It told the American people to stay away from schools. It told them not to go to the grocery store unless they were prepared to wipe everything down with an alcohol wipe afterwards and to be heavily masked the entire time you were there. It told them not even to go to church for very long periods of time. Uh, we, we saw this in, 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 in Utah. There were many of us in Utah who had never, apart from being hospitalized, uh, deathly ill to the point of needing hospitalization or traveling somewhere, uh, had never really missed church uh, before. And then all of a sudden, we were expected, we were asked, in many, many cases, mandated by government with the back, uh, with the back uh, support and in sometimes urging or mandating of the federal government to stay away from these things. Uh, at the time, this scared me to death. And at the time, I, I called my friend Scott Winship, who was uh, by then uh, at AEI, and I said, what are going to be some of the effects of this? What should we worry about, uh, about kids being isolated, uh, about so many people being isolated? Of course, at that point, we could offer up only conjecture. We could offer up only speculation about what might happen. But a, a lot of the concerns that we identified up front are starting to come to pass. So we spent all these trillions of dollars in order to combat the adverse effects of the COVID pandemic. But what are we doing to combat the pandemic of loneliness, of existential dread, and of despair? Things that we facilitated, that we funded, that we mandated during the pandemic. As the great American writer John Steinbeck said, a sad soul can kill you quicker than a germ. Now, Steinbeck's prescient common sense was recently reaffirmed by the Surgeon General, who has declared loneliness in America to be an epidemic. Now, big shocker there. Uh, a lot of us who have followed social capital, studied it, uh, have, have known that for years. But it's good to have the Surgeon General of the United States now acknowledging that it, it is an epidemic and that it has deadly effects. I remember talking to Scott uh, back in 2020 and trying to figure out what we could discern from what might be the latent hidden effects uh, of lockdowns. If you look back, um, I don't remember the exact dates or the exact statistics, but following the Spanish flu pandemic of a little over a century ago, there were a few years that went by and then after that uh, in initial period, you saw increases in things like suicidality. And I, I, I hope we can reverse course from that. I hope that that doesn't befall us here. But I think that's the kind of thing that the Surgeon General is seeing leading to comments like this one. Look, I, I know that uh, now we can take great comfort, however, because I know that America is not a nation of sad souls. That's not who we are. We're optimists. We win things. We encounter challenges and we get knocked down, but we get back up. We're a nation of resilient and compassionate individuals who have the power to uplift one another through kindness and empathy and connection. We are, in short, resilient because we are compassionate. That's the secret to our success. And by fostering a culture of empathy and support, we can combat the pandemic of loneliness and despair much more effectively than we did the viral pandemic and emerge stronger and more united than ever before. This is the kind of vi vital work that's happening right here at the American Enterprise Institute. And what we glean from programs like the Social Capital Project has the potential to affect positive policy change in a way that our current approach wrongly neglects and that our federal government has uh, chronically neglected at great cost to the American people. And the message is spreading. In fact, just, just this week, um, I, I was approached by my uh, colleague, Senator Chris Murphy, uh, a Democratic senator from Connecticut. Um, and, and Chris Murphy and I uh, are always looking for things that we can agree on, but suffice it to say that uh, we disagree on, on plenty as well. We don't always agree. Um, he told me that he had just stumbled across some of the Joint Economic Committee's social capital project uh, uh, papers and research finding. And he said, as soon as I stumbled across it, quite by accident, I started reading the reports. And once I read one of them, I couldn't stop. And I, 
kept reading report after report, and he said, I've just barely scratched the surface of this thing, but it's beautiful. The, 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 uh, the implications of this thing are broad and wide. And he said, I'd, I'd like to get involved in this one, one way or another. So um, I, I take great courage at that fact, and it was timely given my, my visit here today. So as he was saying this, his countenance was bright, and his, his smile was wide, and, and praised these great findings. Look, we're just getting started with the Social Capital Project. Uh, we're just barely scratching the surface. There's a lot that remains to be done, and I'm looking forward to being an aide to the American Enterprise Institute as we work together to combat the epidemic of loneliness that's plaguing our country, an epidemic to which the federal government has unfortunately contributed. If social bonds are a capital-like commodity, then AEI is the angel investor injecting social capital and injecting regular capital and injecting all of this effort into a connection craving society. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Lee, for those very kind remarks. And thank you especially for starting the Social Capital Project, uh, which I'm grateful to have had the opportunity to participate in. Um, I think one of the more important things uh, that, that uh, has, has come out of Congress uh, in the last uh, five or six years. Um, uh, I'm glad that it continues on uh, as well. Um, Senator Lee has votes. And while I can say you've never done a brisk walk until you've tried to follow the senator through the halls of the Senate office buildings and the Capitol building. Uh, he does need to, uh, uh, to leave uh, shortly. Um, I think we have time for one question from the audience. Um, if there are questions, where? Oh, sure, right here. Senator, do you, do you feel that you saw as a, a leg up on other states because of the? Hi, I'm Bruce Klein, <laughs> Pension <laughs> Policy Center. Senator, do you feel that Utah has a leg up on the other states of the United States because of the, the rich culture and heritage that Utah has? Yes, yes. Um, look, um, like any individual, any other community or, or culture, um, we, we stand on the shoulders of those who came before us. And there are some things that work in Utah's benefit when it comes to high social capital scores, historically. When my ancestors uh, started arriving in the, the Salt Lake Valley, uh, in, in what is now Utah, uh, back in the late 1840s, starting in July of 1847, I think there were two trees standing in that valley. And I, 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 I wish we had uh, live uh, video footage that we could watch today of Brigham Young walking out onto Promontory Point and, and looking out and saying, this is the place. And I, I wonder what some of my ancestors said in response to that, like, really? This is it? There's like two trees in that valley. Why would we want to live there? And that, it turned out, uh, was the, sort of the garden uh, spot of the state. A lot of my ancestors got uh, sent to much more rugged, uh, even drier conditions where they all almost died. So we, we moved to this high, cold desert uh, where there was a lot of hostility, ancestors seeking freedom from religious persecution. Others joined later who were seeking freedom of one sort or another, uh, but they got there. In part because of the hostile environment and what brought so many people there to the state to begin with, we got off uh, on a good foot when it comes to social capital because it was a matter of survival. And j just like in so many other parts of the country, anywhere you look where you see poverty, where you see success, you can often trace things back uh, 150 years, things that happened 150, 160 years earlier that might have something to do with the success or the challenges that people face today. So yeah, we, we, we have a lot of that that's built in and um, a lot of our communities uh, remain close and intact because our, our parents and their parents and their parents before them uh, did that, taught that to us as a matter of survival. Please join me in thanking Senator Lee again. Um, we'll ask you to uh, remain seated uh, for a moment, and then um, there will be lunch served uh, outside uh, in the hallway. Um, 
You can take that back in here. Uh, we'll start the panels up again, uh, I believe at one o'clock. Um, and uh, yeah, so we've, we're uh, partway through. We've got a couple more panels this afternoon that I think you'll enjoy. Um, but thanks again for, uh, for coming and hope you enjoy lunch.
the, the folks with stamina um, here for uh, part two of the of the day. Uh, so we just had a session on um, the family. Uh, this one we're moving on uh, to cover a bunch of a bunch of topics: uh, culture, place, institutions, and civil society. Um, so this is this is essentially all of the mediating structures that are not. Uh, family, uh, and uh, we have a carve out for religious organizations in the in the next panel uh, tied to a, a paper that that we put out today. Um, but I'm very excited about uh, this group. Um, uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and uh, provide some um, introductions for folks as I call on them. We'll have everybody give sort of some initial remarks, and then have uh, hopefully a conversation um, at the end. Um, We'll go in order, I think, of uh, how folks are seated, starting with, with Yuval. Um, so Yuval Levin is the Director of Social, Cultural, and Constitutional Studies at AEI, uh, where he also holds the Beth and Ravenel Curry Chair in Public Policy. He's the founder and editor of National Affairs. Uh, Yuval served as a member of the White House Domestic Policy Staff under President George W. Bush. He was also Executive Director of the President's Council on Bioethics uh, and a Congressional Staffer earlier in his career. Um, so Yuval, we'll start with you uh, with just uh, some thoughts on uh, one or more of uh, uh, the broad topics that we've, that we've uh, uh, assembled for this panel. Well, thank you very much, Scott. I appreciate that. Um, it, it's really it, wonderful to be part of this. And uh, I just want to say so far the conversations have been fantastic. And the, uh, I'm just very excited about this project. And Scott and Kevin are starting something awfully important here at AI. And we're very proud to be the home for it. Um, this panel is about everything, and so, uh, and I was asked to be brief, and so I, I think w what I want to talk about is, in a sense, the, the secret ingredient in social capital, which is trust. Um, and it's the secret ingredient in two respects, both in that it is essential and that it is not, I think, widely understood. Um, and trust is hard to define, trust is hard to nail down, and yet any time we talk about what social capital is for and the ways in which it can contribute to mobility and to reaching opportunity, we end up talking about trust because social capital enables you to benefit from, uh, from trust across uh, relationships and institutions. It enables you to build trust. It has something to do with trust. And so I want to say a few words about what we really mean by trust, and especially in talking about these broader social institutions, so not so much in the family, maybe not even within a religious community where people are close and share a lot to begin with, but trust across trust among strangers, which is an incredibly important factor in the success of a free society. It's impossible for a free society to function without a huge amount of trust. If you just ask yourself, Think about what you've done so far today and how much trust in people you don't really know has been involved in that. And I think it's important for us to think about where that comes from because w one of the ways in which we are living through a kind of social crisis is that we are living through a collapse of trust. Um, I think that if, if you tried to summarize the vast literature on this question, um, one bad way to do it, which I will do, um, is to think about trust along two axes, which is to think about trust in terms of evident competence and evident restraint. We trust people, and especially people who we don't know very well personally in our lives. We trust them when it seems like they can do what they say and when it seems like they won't do us harm for their own benefit. Um, and that combination, those two things, add up to a very powerful force. Um, and oftentimes when we think about the collapse of trust now, uh, particularly the collapse of trust between the public and elites who run institutions in our society, we incline to think in terms of competence. We say we've lived in the 21st century through uh, lots of examples of incompetence from uh, you know Iraq, if I can say that in this building, um, to <laughs> the financial crisis to uh, various failures of the welfare state to the, the pandemic. And so people have lost trust because it seems like the people running things don't know what they're doing. I tend to think that the other axis, evident restraint, is actually a much more important factor in why trust has declined in American society in the 21st century. The sense people have that people with power in different places in our society are not restrained in their use of it. So that the problem is not so much that people don't know what they're doing. There's 
certainly a lot of incompetence in a complex society. I'm not really sure there's more of it now than usual. But there is, I think, a, a more deeply felt sense that people with power just do whatever they want and that they use that power to elevate themselves, that they use that power to try to build their own following, to build a personal brand. They're not doing their job, their core job. They're doing something else. And that makes it very hard for us to trust them. So that when we look at, uh, at, at, at public health officials in the pandemic, the problem is not that they didn't know everything and prevent it from happening. That's not really what our expectation was. The trouble is that they seem to be using the authority they had in that moment to do things that were beyond their actual purview uh, and to exercise power in ways that were irresponsible. I think one way to understand the nature of the social crisis we're living in now is that the public is saying to American elites, we don't trust you to be restrained. And American elites are answering, but we do know what we're doing. Um, and those two things can both be right at the same time. And the, to, to say, actually, I'm an expert, I do know what I'm doing here, is not a way of proving that you are restrained in your use of power and authority. And so that we've got people talking past each other in ways that exacerbate mistrust and the loss of trust, which raises really the question of how you can demonstrate restraint. And there, I think it's, it's important that the question of institutions was included in our subject for this panel, because oftentimes you demonstrate restraint by playing the role assigned to you within an institutional framework, by being a professional and saying, this, is, this part is my job, that part is not my job. Um, and that's really why we trust professionals. You know, we, we trust, uh, we trust a, a scientist because that's a person who, before they say something, has put it through some process, some kind of, of professional process of verification. Uh, we trust a journalist, if you can remember trusting a journalist, um, because that, again, is a person whose work, before it, it, it emerges as assertions, goes through some process of affirmation, verification. We, we trust an accountant, not just because they know more about the tax laws than we do, but because that seems like a person who's not going to sign their name to something that they don't think is true. And as soon as we don't believe that anymore, as soon as we no longer have the sense that, these, that this person is constrained by institutional and professional and other kinds of obligations, then we don't have the ability to trust them anymore. Which, to close, the, if we think about how we fix the collapse of trust across gaps and spaces in our society, I think a lot of it has to involve allowing ourselves to be constrained, to be evidently formed by institutional obligations, and to show that we are operating within professional constraints, within institutional constraints, within an ethos that we can point to, uh, rather than just operating as individuals on a stage performing and building our own uh, following. And th th that connects to the questions we've been talking about in terms of uh, building social capital in some very profound ways. Because in the absence of trust between the broad public and people with power in our institutions, it becomes very, very difficult for people to think about the opportunities our society offers as being there for them. Uh, there's, a, there's a tremendous tendency to look at the opportunities our society offers and say, those are there for other people, and they're not there for me. To believe they're there for you requires an enormous amount of trust, which requires not only a sense that people know what they're doing in our society, but also that they know what not to do. And I think that's a lesson we're really going to have to learn if the 21st century is going to see a revival of social capital. Thanks, Yval. Uh, the importance of restraint on a panel that which the topic uh, seems to require no restraint on. Um, so Ryan, you're next for this everything bagel uh, of a panel. Um, Ryan Streeter is the State Farm James Q. Wilson Scholar and Director of Domestic Policy Studies at AEI, where he oversees research in education, technology, housing, urban policy, opportunity, workforce development, and public opinion. Before joining AI, he was executive director of the Center for Politics and Governance at the U University of Texas at Austin. And before that, he served in a variety of roles, including top positions with Indianapolis Mayor Stephen Goldsmith, Indiana Governor Mike Pence, and President George H.W. Bush. Ryan. Thank you, Scott. And thanks to all of you for being here. Um, this is a great day. Great group of people here. Great topics. And um, we're just... All of us at AI are just really thrilled about what you and Kevin and the team are all building with the new um, center and the focus on these issues where AI really has become just a place where these conversations and debates can actually happen in, in ways that are really productive. So it's great to be a part 
a part of this. Um, Scott said we could talk about anything. So, <laughs> well, <laughs> so I'm going to uh, no. I'll put away my notes on 20th century German epistemology and talk about that later. Um, I'll talk about social capital and uh, uh, do that in a way that's um, that's rooted in some of the survey data that we have here at AEI. Um, I think. Uh, many of you know that we do kind of large national surveys here through our Survey Center on American Life, and that's enabled us to kind of um, kind of revive some of this survey-based research on community-based social capital measurement generation uh, questions that maybe hadn't been asked in a long time that we've kind of uh, revived. And so I want to give you, um, uh, coming from the institutional level that you've all talking about down to the kind of the neighborhood level and the informal institutions of social capital, kind of a a few things that we have found that I think are um, important and have consequences for people that are interested in these issues, interested in how to generate social capital, interested in what it is, um, interested in what kinds of things correlate with it. Um, one thing that we try to do is to look at the relationships between the differences between formal and informal social capital. So the, the formal social capital that was probably you know, best popularized by the research of, of Bob Putnam and others on measuring people's engagement in the institutions of civil society and nonprofit organizations, volunteering, that sort of a thing. Um, but there's also informal social capital, which is the strength of your relationships that you form just by living your life and being involved with others, unplanned, uh, informal get-togethers, um, the, the way in which we interact with each other at home, um, at work and in those third places where we're, when we're not at home and, and we're not at work, where are we? When we're, when we're interacting with people there, we, we also generate uh, beneficial social capital. And I'm, and I'm presupposing in my remarks that high, high levels of social capital are good. Um, we've, we're just gonna kind of say that's established. It's, it's been measured in so many different ways that I'm not gonna make that case. I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about what we've learned about the nature of social capital. So one thing that we found is that just uh, subjective well-being, self-reported levels of happiness, um, consistent with other uh, types of research that have been done, just rise as people are engaged both formally and informally in their communities. And we have ways of, of distilling um, people's uh, levels of engagement by asking them how often they talk with their neighbors, how often they run into people that they don't know and start up a conversation, and also how often they volunteer. And we group them into the people that are uh, low on the social scale, low on the civic scale, you know, high on the civic scale, but low on the social scale. That would be like your condo association president, you know, not very good at social relationships, but they're really engaged. Um, and then there's the people that are really social, but not really civically engaged, like most of the people in their 30s that live in the DC metro area. And then, um, and then you have people that are high in both, both categories. And you'll see the low social, low civic people's self-reported happiness, only, only about two-thirds of that group, and there's still a majority of them, about two-thirds will say most days they feel pretty happy with their lives. Um, when you're high civic and low social or, um, or vice versa, you're right about the same, about, about eight in 10 of them say they're, they're happy most days. But the people that are both, it's, it's over 90%. And so that just confirms what we sort of know, is that when, um, when you're engaged in voluntary activity, that's good, but it's not as good as being engaged in voluntary activity and just having a lot of friends and having a lot of interaction with people. Um, we find that when we look just at formal social capital and we, we look at volunteering rates over against our, uh, we have a uh, loneliness index that we create by using kind of the UCLA loneliness index questions and, and judging, you're able to assess just how socially isolated people are and we, are able to, to look at how that affects, um, or is related to, I should say, the, the volunteering rates that, that people have. And we, we find that the average kind of loneliness score for millennials is about the national average. If it, the score is a 41, which means nothing to you, but on our scale, it's a, that's where, where they are. And the average baby boomer has a lower score, which means they're less, less lonely. And that makes sense. The older you get and the longer you live in your communities, the more um, friends that you have. Uh, the, the crisis of loneliness among young people has been documented going back till we first started documenting these things in the 40s. Every generation, we, we go through this spasm of talking about young people being lonely. It turns out young people just are lonelier, um, especially when they get out of college or they, they start working because they don't know very many people and everything is new. Um, but when you, when you add on um, these various stages of engagement, you move to engagement in a religious organization, that average loneliness scale for millennials drops. You add 
on um, engagement in, in voluntary activity at least once a month. And then you add marriage to that. And when you add those three things, the loneliness score of millennials drops uh, down uh, right on par with uh, boomers that are in the same category. So those, those institutional engagements are really powerful on people's sense of connectedness. And I think that, that there's a lot to that. So when we're talking about the crisis of loneliness in the country, we should be talking about this against the backdrop of the types of engagements that people do or don't have in their lives. Um, not all formal so social capital is the same, however. When we look at 18 to 34-year-olds, young adults, who are socially active, those who report lots of friends and lots of engagement with their friends, and we look at um, their other types of engagements, we find out that those who are socially active but not lonely, they're socially active and not lonely, which you would think those things would, would always go together, but they don't, um, they're six times more likely to be engaged um, in religious organizations than political volunteering. And when you look at people that are socially active, but they also report being highly uh, social, socially isolated on our index, um, they're about two times more likely to be involved in political volunteering than they are in religious organizations. When we ask people to choose from 11 different types of voluntary activities, whether it's being involved in a local private charity, a veterans group, a sports club, we find that everybody that's involved regularly in volunteering has a loneliness score that's lower than the national average, with the exception of one type of volunteering, and that's political volunteering. So people that only volunteer politically have loneliness scores that are above the national average, which either, either our politics is just you know, selecting lonely people or it's hollowing out our souls, a combination of both, we're not entirely sure. Um, and when you look at, one thing that's interesting is, the, is values, and our values are obviously, we don't form them in a vacuum, we form them in the context of families and communities. And we, we ask the question about the American dream, how do you define it? And then we look at where people are, kind of our loneliness index, it's interesting. Um, the people who have higher loneliness scores um, are more likely to select the becoming wealthy or very material, what we would consider materialistic definitions of the American dream. And that flips when you start, you talk about making a lot of money, having a successful career, and then if, you're, if your favorite definition of the American dream is making a meaningful contribution to your community, um, the people who select that as, as their number one definition are some of the least lonely people in the country. And, and the, the, the one definition about being free to choose my life as, as I would want to live it is also actually chosen the most by people who are not lonely. So you would think it would be highly individualistic people, but it's actually people that are embedded in meaningful relationships that kind of hold to that classic dif definition of the American dream. The last point I wanted to make is what we've learned about the formation of uh, informal uh, social capital. There's lots of ways that happens. It happens in the workplace. But one thing that's kind of come out of our research that we weren't planning to find, but we have uh, discovered on a number of the different surveys we've done is just proximity to those third places in your lives and the frequency with which you're there is also related to um, this sense of self-reported well-being, low levels of loneliness, and feeling like you yourself are willing to help your neighbors are living in a place that's really uh, engaged. And so when we ask people how far they are from, from these sorts of things, you know, your favorite coffee shop, a bar, a restaurant, the dog park. Um, dog, people who take their dogs to dog parks are really the, among the least lonely people in the country, amazingly enough. So, they, yeah, that's right. You, you meet people because of, uh, of your dogs. Uh, uh, you know your, each other's dogs' names without knowing each other, but somehow you become friends. Um, the, um, when, when you're uh, regularly at a cluster of these things, three to four to five to six of these things, um, during the week, and they are within five to ten minutes from where you live, uh, whether you're walking or by car, and that's, that's actually something that I think is important to distill here, it really is a time and proximity thing, then it is our preference for the type of neighborhood. I mean, I, I've always lived in walkable, dense urban environments. I've raised two young adult children there. They've never had a backyard or garage. That's my preference. I'm a statistical oddball. Most people don't live that way. But if you live, even if you live in a suburban cul-de-sac, but you're five to 10 minutes away from these places where you frequently go, the effects on you and, and your, your relationships is, 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 is just the same as someone that lives in a dense area. And we found that in the people who live in a high amenity context where they're regularly somewhere, they have got a number of places that they go to when they're not at home and they're not at work, you see the very same patterns. When you say, how willing are people in your neighborhood to help those people around them and how willing are you to volunteer, the rates are, are a lot higher, as in two times as high in, in high amenity versus low amenity places. And then when you ask the, the trust question, the general trust question that's frequent in a lot of surveys that want to measure this that just asked you, in general, do you think people can be trusted or you can't be too careful? Uh, you find the same effects, that in high amenity areas, people are much more trusting of, of each other 
uh, in re at least relative to that question than in moderate and low amenity places. And it stair steps down. If it's a moderate amenity thing and then it's a low amenity uh, environment, you see this kind of downward step in, in how people answer the, the trust question. So I think there are implications for that just in terms of the way we think about our communities, the way that we design our communities, if that's your profession or if you're interested in it, and the various ways that we make it possible for people just to bump into each other. So the volunteering stuff is important, but the bumping into each other regularly is also important. And I think we need to reckon with both of those. Great, thanks, Ryan. Uh, it's a positive spin on the, the saying, I forget who said it, that if you want a friend in Washington, get a dog. Right? Yeah, that's right, exactly. It might uh, be more true than you think. That's right. Um, OK, so we've got trust, we've got institutions, we've got informal social capital, uh, we've got civic engagement. Um, uh, our next speaker, I think, will be talking more about uh, culture and, uh, and, and national community to some extent. Um, Colin Woodard is director of Nationhood Lab at Salve Regina University's Pell Center for International Relations and Public Policy. Um, Colin is a New York Times best-selling historian, Polk Award-winning journalist. He's one of the most respected authorities on North American regionalism, the sociology of United States nationhood, and how our colonial past shapes and explains the present. He's the award-winning, the author of the award-winning American Nations, a history of the 11 rival regional cultures of North America that we're gonna hear about. And it's a book I would definitely commend to everyone. Um, uh, Woodard has written a number of other highly regarded books as well. He's a political contributing editor, was state and national affairs writer at the Portland Press Herald and Maine Sunday Telegram. Uh, and perhaps most importantly to me, he grew up in Waterville, Maine, which was my uh, high school rival. Um, uh, I would live in the next town over. My folks live in Waterville. Um, neither here nor there, um, but we're glad to have uh, Colin here in Washington, D.C. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, as if this panel doesn't have enough, I'm going to bring in some of the macro situation. I'm a scholar of North American regionalism and I guess the problems of United States nationhood past and present. How do we hold this republic together and continue the American experiment? And I wanted to bring some of the macro issues because you know, I think they're related. You know, I did a, um, do, do you know James and, uh, and Deb Fallow series, Our Towns? It was a TV show, but also an Atlantic series. They went all over the country looking at places where people cooperate. And what they said in their thing is, we never talk about national politics. Because then all the divides pop up then. If you never talk about it, the divides never show up. People seem to get along. And that was my experience. I did a series for Politico a few years ago called What Works. It was essentially a series of magazine articles, like a dozen of them all over the country, of some incredible thing that some metro region had done that everyone else ought to know about. It could be a cure for homelessness. It could be Denver building their light rail system. Albuquerque's mayor figuring out you know, a new plan. But the, what was common about these, we were self-selecting for places where there'd been this amazing success you all should know about. And what I found in common again, even though that wasn't how I selected them, you had the, all these places that succeeded, all the groups were like together working together. And it never came up what party they were in, although it was obviously you often had Democratic inner city mayors with Republic, uh, suburban mayors who were probably Republicans. You had the, you know, the plutocrats, philanthropists and Fortune 500 guys and the punk rockers and everyone somehow was able to convene that allowed these things to succeed. Again, oftentimes it's the national bigger picture stuff that can drive and affect the micro. So I'm interested in this conversation about the micro-macro relationships. But I'm gonna give you a little bit of macro very quickly if somebody has the slides to pop up. You know, one of the problems that we have, which I click it to advance, or is it a, yeah. So one of the problems that we have in general in this country, you know, you have the red state, blue state divide and all the rest. Well, why is that? I mean, part of it is that when you go way back to our fundamental problems and what makes it so hard to hold the United States nation together, and we lack the same level of consensus a lot of societies do, is that we started as separate countries. And by countries, I mean the separate rival colonial projects that formed on the eastern and southwestern rims of what's now the United States. So Puritans in New England, the Dutch in the area around New York City, the Scots-Irish in the back country, the West Indies slave lords from Barbados coming into the lowland south, the Spanish going south to north into the southwest, and so on. These were societies that all had separate religious and political and ethnographic characteristics, different ideas of the kind of society they were creating. Then they ended up together, oddly enough, 
but they had settled in mutually exclusive settlement bands for the most part out through the 1840s, you know, about two thirds of what's now the continental United States, and in each case, leaving behind their cultural ethos, formatting the hard drive, if you will, for the, the people who came later. That's why we have red and blue states, and that's also why we have some states that have been perpetually riven into mutually hostile sections since their beginning, because the settlement streams didn't follow state lines. So in places like Ohio or California, or Washington, Oregon, they were settled by two different colonial projects, or three. And in other places like Maine or South Carolina or Kentucky, it was more of one. You have sort of an easier identity. These all cause problems. This is what they look like today, but it's based on settlement patterns. And you'll see this pattern over and over in American life. And it doesn't just affect our political scene, it affects all sorts of things. Certainly elections, when you have a competitive election, again, you gotta look at the county level. Our true regional cultures and understanding the power of regionalism requires you forget about state lines because that's not where the cultures came from. Trace the phenomenon back to the beginning and roll it out. You look at the county level and you can see it over and over again. These are the patterns in the 1916 election between Woodrow Wilson and Charles Hughes. This is 2008, Barack Obama versus John McCain. In many respects the same, parties have reversed as they reverse polarity and constituencies, it shouldn't be happy the tectonic plates are the same. Hey, you'll see lots of elections where the whole map's blue or red. I mean, this is just when it gets competitive. When things get tough, things start getting tough on these particular fissures. You can see it even within parties. Oh, there's the rare opportunities where you can look at a primary election where there was a competitive race with only two candidates and you had the same choice at the beginning of the primaries and the end. That rare opportunity was the Democratic primaries in 2016. This is just the Democratic electorate. So Democrats in green, all those counties are places where Democrats in 2016 preferred Bernie Sanders and the ones in yellow are those who preferred Hillary Clinton. In the terms of the American nations, nations, you can see a total dominance of Bernie Sanders in the places I call Yankeedom, New Netherland, Left Coast, and Far West. The Midlands, our classic uh, swing region, and Greater Appalachia split, and Clinton dominating the regions I call Tidewater, the Deep South, and El Norte. You see it in recent elections. Here's the 2022 midterms in California. This is the U.S. Senate race. Now, Padilla, of course, is gonna win. California is a blue state, but one of its regions has never agreed with the others. That's the interior zone known as the far west. I made this paradigm in 2011, so I wasn't you know, making this up for the purposes of these elections. But you can see that he actually lost the far western section by five points, and not only that, he lost, if only urban counties had voted in that election, he would have lost the far west. And the rural counties, if only rural people had voted in the left coast, Padilla would have won that section. So I mean, it transcends that you see that over and over again. Texas, Beto O'Rourke actually beat Greg Abbott in the El Norte region. And hey, yeah, we hear a lot about Houston and Dallas and the democratic strength in those places. If only urban county voters had voted in the greater Appalachia and Deep South districts, Beto O'Rourke still would have lost. So it's, it transcends rural versus urban. But most importantly for our discussion, it's not just politics, it's all sorts of things. Like disease, these are the diabetes rates. Red's bad, green's good. Greater Appalachia's not a great place to be. These are credit scores. You probably saw this in the Washington Post earlier this year. This is the mean FICO score by county. Blue's good, gold is, uh, gold is good, blue is bad. And the amazing thing is if you look at that map, there are incredibly rich counties in the bad zone and incredibly poor counties in the gold zone, but they seem to be geographically sorted, strangely enough. You see it in COVID vaccination rates per capita. We did this snapshot uh, in August 2021 because that's at the point where vaccines have been widely available. If you wanted to be vaccinated, you could have by then. And so we took a snapshot at that point. And you have almost a two to one difference between the Deep South, skeptical on vaccines, and say the left coast or Yankeedom. That's quite a difference within the same federated polity. Where do the uninsured live? People without health insurance. Red is bad in this map. And notice that in key places, you, you don't know your American nation's map at this glance yet, but in many key places like Virginia and Louisiana and other states, you see the gap following the regional lines even though health insurance policies and rules are set at the state level. You still see the divisions within states. You see it in gun violence. This is the per capita gun homicide rates. They all track regionally to a staggering degree. Two and threefold differences between many of the large regions like Yankeedom, which is the greater New England, New Englanders and their descendants settled space, and the Deep South. A sevenfold difference between the Deep South and New Netherland, 
which despite being the most densely populated part of the country, actually is the safest place by all these metrics on regional terms. Um, this particular one is just whites only homicide rate differences. And the differences are, again, manifold, but you see them in all the other patterns as well. This is uh, Census Bureau, so immigration. Where did the great immigration wave of the late 19th and 20th century go and not go? Well, because census takers asked, are you foreign born or not? People were able to assemble density maps. Where did they go? You're on a county basis is where they went. The darker the shading, the higher the proportion of the population uh, was an immigrant in 1900 in the middle of that wave. Notice nobody went to the Tidewater and the Deep South and Greater Appalachia, almost exactly following the settlement lines. This has powerful knock-on effects in terms of ideas about American identity and even the religious fabric of the place. Because that also means that places which had immigrants in those waves had to become accustomed, like it or not, Protestant America had to confront and deal with, there will now be Catholics and Orthodox Christians and Chinese people and Jews will be here, whereas that was not something that had to be dealt with in the other regions. It also left, so, so the Deep South and those other regions were remained almost solely Protestant in that sense. Here is the 2010 Census Bureau by county dominant religion now. Red is Baptist. Gray is the uh, LDS settlement zone out in the, uh, in the uh, far west. Uh, you can see in the Midlands a trace of the green counties which are Methodist. But blue is your marker for that giant wave. You know, the Catholics were the largest you know, plurality in that. And you can see in the same regions the same trace even left for today. And that leaves us with you know, all sorts of divides. And so my work, that was stuff I've been doing for 10 years, but I've been interested in the entire time And okay, if that's always been the case, if that was the challenge from the beginning when we were fighting the British in 1776, we had to hold a coalition together, or we had to come together and create a constitutional set of arrangements based on trust in a group of uh, countries that did not trust each other to try to create a system where you could all checkmate each other. How did you ever create a United States nation? It had to be done ex post facto afterwards. They, all, they beat the British, we all ended up in the United States. What does it mean? And there's been an effort to try to create a meaning for all of us, the different colonial regimes, you could call it red states and blue states or whatever you want to call it now. That's been a challenge throughout. And I've been interested in how have we succeeded in the past and how could we succeed in the future? And in, just in brief, we're doing all that at Nationhood Lab, we're working on exactly that project. But the answer is, if you dig into history, there's only one thing that can kind of transcend and have the depth in history. And it's that idea, that civic national definition that we're, we may not share a common past or religion or ethnography, but we share a set of ideals in the Declaration of Independence. And that it's the commitment to those ideals that can hold us together, which is the definition of the American promise, the American experiment. But they're badly understood. What's it all mean? In the 18th century, I don't think people, everyone ignored it for 60 or 70 years. It wasn't until Lincoln at Gettysburg that we kind of actually became like a covenant that this might be one of the versions of the, it was contested from the beginning by an ethno-national vision, still contested from time to time. But what we need to do is be able to figure out, okay, what do these ideals mean in the 21st century? How do you talk about them? And that's the work we're doing. We're not just drafting together the brilliant you know, talk I could give at AEI or an Atlantic essay. That's a starting point. We're actually doing all the quantitative, qualitative work to figure out the messaging strategy on how you talk about this today to try to create that common ground that anyone who's really committed to the American experiment regardless of party and regional location and all the rest, might be able to congregate under, which I think is probably 70% of us. And so that's my, you know, my go and contribution to that experiment. However, it has up and down relationships with all the micro stuff, and it depends on social capital and trust. So I'm you know, thrilled to jump into this conversation with that matrix in mind. Thanks a lot, Colin. Um, I think I'm going to ask one question, and we'll see if uh, if we've got some time for audience Q and A too. Um, so, how do we uh, trying to tie all all of these themes together a little bit? How do we balance um, uh, identifying with a with a lo more local community and 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 sort of a uh, identifying with a national community? We've got all this regional polarization. Um, does does sort of dealing with that? paradoxically require that we embrace federalism in our national policies. Um, for instance, you know, do we need to send abortion policy to the states in order to prevent regional polarization on the issue uh, from destroying the sense that we're all Americans with shared values and ideals? 
does polarization on issues corrode the sense of national community, or uh, does, does that happen regardless of what we do uh, in terms of federal policy? Um, would those uh, divisions recur even if we even if we had uh, fewer um, national debates at the, in, in D.C. about some of these issues? Anyone should feel free to jump in. Well, I, maybe I'll start. I, I, I do think that one of the ways that we can address that challenge is through what we've come to call federalism. American federalism is a very strange thing. It's, um, it, it, it's, not, it's not simply decentralization or subsidiarity. Uh, it has elements of these. But federalism emerged almost accidentally in the course of the creation of the Constitution. If you, if you, if you look at the debates at the convention, there were really two sides, one of which wanted to eliminate the, the state governments entirely. I mean, Hamilton makes that case on day one. Um, and another which thought, this is just a confederation. The states have to stay entirely sovereign. And the ultimate compromise just said yes to both options, in a sense. It did not create a, uh, a, a, a national government that surrounds and oversees the states. It created two parallel governing structures, both of which are sovereign, both of which govern the people directly, not through one another. Um, but they operate in different arenas. They touch different issues. And I think that there is a kind of magic in that without, without attributing it to the profound wisdom of that moment. It was actually a compromise. There wouldn't have been anybody's choice. But I think there's, there's tremendous value in that because it allows us precisely to have a politics in which people can cooperate where they are, don't always have to be fighting about national issues, and yet we also have a, a national uh, politics where we can debate national issues and where we can embody that kind of common national story that Colin gets to, which is so crucial. Um, there can be a local politics and a national politics at the same time, and they don't have to be the same thing. I think we've screwed this up some. I mean, we now have a much more entangled and intermixed kind of federalism. Uh, where we think of the states as, as, as sort of d doing the work of the federal government too often. But if, if we're able to keep them separate, and if we're able to think about what American federalism has done for our capacity for national unity, I think there is still now a lot of promise in that. The, there's always going to be a debate about which issues belong where. And so is abortion a national issue or a state issue it, it is a perfectly reasonable question. But to see that those are two options and that, they're, and that it's important to understand them as distinct, I do think has got to be part of the solution to the problem you're describing. Yeah. And, um, I mean, we can have multiple identities at once. We all do as humans, right? I'm a Yankees fan. I'm a, you know, Catholic. I'm a, a resident of New Hampshire. And I'm an American. Whatever it is, we hold those identities. So we can do both at the same time. Federalism can be really important, but I think there's a key moment where where the federal government is involved is where those key ideals of the promise that is the thing that we need to, we actually need to kind of police that we are all going to be involved at a certain level on those perimeters. I mean, that's what ended up happening in the civil rights movement when the federal government intervened at key moments, right? It is a violation of the principles in the Declaration, and rightly so, that all of us might take a stake in that. I mean, I think... There will be an argument, there's a gray areas as to where it all lies. But I think, in principle, that's where the federal government starts playing a role that may be a vigorous role over the states. And I'll, I mean, and, and I agree with everything you've all noticed and said, and he, he's, he knows what I'm about to say as well, but that everything got murkier in that relationship between the states and the federal government when we started expanding westward and you had federal territory, that then the, the federal government would create new states. And those states, in essence, were dependent on the federal government for protection because those territory was being taken by the people who were living there at the time. And, and so that created a much, it made murky the whole relationship between federal and local as we expanded during the 19th century. But um, yes, you know, the, the principles out there are correct. I mean, I think in some ways today, the case for <clears throat> federalism is made stronger just by the way things have turned out than, than the founders could have imagined when they were negotiating their way to this, to this agreement. I mean, there, clearly there's a, lot of his, there's a lot of historical work on the need for a certain type of structure of subsidiarity, whether, whether you go back into Catholic social teaching or you look at the flowering of this thought in the wake of the Protestant Reformation in the continent on up through the UK, I mean, the, the case for why we need strong communities and they need to be self-governing to the extent that they can has, has a long history. Um, but, but we didn't really know how it was going to work out here um, after it was set up, as you've always was saying. And I think that the, 
the notion of competitive federalism in America is really powerful. It's a really strong um, explainer for our national prosperity and, and how uh, we move around and how we self-sort into places with greater and lesser opportunity. And that's a lot harder to do in Europe. I mean, you can create the European Union, but it's still a lot harder to move from Barcelona to Berlin than it is to move from New York to Nashville. Um, and so I think that a lot of our, our prosperity is, is because we have these different places that have different histories. Um, they even have different um, laws and different rates of taxation and different uh, regional and local cultures. And I think that's generally worked to our benefit. And I think, I think we need to do what we can to preserve that. So the, um, the, the one thing that I would, would say I think is in, in, important, if you agree with that uh, uh, premise, is that a lot of, despite all of the difference that we have regionally in this country, I actually think it's our very local interests which unify us nationally more, you know, kind of paradoxically than, than the national issues that we're supposed to sign up for. And you see this in the polling over and again. Um, and my favorite surveys and polls are the ones that ask intensity questions, not just are you pro-life or pro-choice or are you for the death penalty or against it? It's how much do you care about that issue? And when we ask questions that way, we find out that things like crime in my kid's school, school, the quality of those schools, um, the local economy's prospects for me and my children, whether or not my kids can afford a house when they get out of college, these are the things that probably two thirds of Americans would check the very box on. I, I care about this a lot, very much. And on our hot button um, culture war and social issues that we spend a lot of time hyperventilating about, especially here in Washington, D.C., it's really hard to get a lot of people to check the very box. There's tons of somewhats on that. So, so you can be for or against one of those culture war issues, but it's not your top priority. And, and what people continue to prioritize is the things that, that are, are happening locally. And I think there's a lot of lessons for that in, in policymakers. Um, I, I should say, I, I feel like I should round out these remarks by making one observation too, just about our competitive federalism, though that is a very real issue that I don't feel like we've figured out how to deal with the, the, the dark side of that. And, it's, and the best way I know how to talk about that is, is just with these data points. If you go back to just 1985, it wasn't that long ago, um, and you look at the 15 most unequal metropolitan areas in the country, uh, most unequal judged by the difference between the top 10% and low, lowest 10% of earners, um, they, they were overwhelmingly mid-sized metros. I think the only major metro over a million people was New Orleans. Uh, over half of them were in the South. And so 20 years after the Civil Rights Act, our, our metropolitan, you know, most people in America live in, in metro areas, whether they're large or small, was, you know, the legacy of racial discrimination and racial segregation. And you fast forward to today and use that same metric of the 15 most unequal metro areas. And it's all the big coastal cities you would think about. It's the one we're sitting in. It's New York, it's San Francisco, it's Los Angeles. Um, none of those smaller mid-sized metros from the 80s are on that list anymore. Um, and the only one that still is, is is New Orleans. And the gap between the top 10 and bottom 10 um, percent is, is, is bigger in the 15th place than it was in 1985 in the, in the first place, if that makes sense. So we really have just, in, for many of us in our adult lifetimes, lived through a period of time where regional inequality in this country has truly become a class-based thing more than a race-based thing using that, that definition, which doesn't mean those latter issues aren't important, but we haven't figured out exactly what to do about that. And I, and I, do, I do think, you know, when we get into the wonky you know, policy weeds on this, we want to talk first about housing policy and these sorts of things that, that help us um, make it easier for people with lower incomes to move into places. But there's something profoundly cultural about what's happened there that um, we're only now, I think, really starting to understand the consequences of but we, and, and starting to understand how we got there. But we haven't thought enough about how to get um, to a better place. Okay, we'll do uh, one question uh, from Howard. You, you got you to gotta, uh, wrap all this up in a neat bow. Scott's uh, one question had seven questions. I was counting, I think. So it's, uh, it's, I, that's I, fine, too. I, I, I'll direct this to Colin, but I'm sure everybody else will join in. The, the maps were incredibly fascinating and could not be more fascinating. And I'm wondering whether uh, there, you could have a band across the South for levels of social capital as well. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you covered that and I missed it, I apologize. And do those in, in that lower band, if you will, the diabetes belt and all of that, do they maintain those kinds of characteristics in the pockets to which they emigrate, including uh, homicide and violence? Uh, 
That, that'll be very interesting. And Scott has my spreadsheet and is tinkering on it, so maybe we'll have some collaborative answers to all that. Those those results exist currently uh, uh, in a in a uh, an Excel spreadsheet right now. Um, so stay tuned. We'll be we'll be writing more about that um, and collaborating with uh, with Colin. Well, that was unsatisfying, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't I didn't even plant that question. Um, all right, I'm going to ask one more question, um, and we're going to shorten your break to five minutes. Uh, uh, any other questions? Yes. Maybe a question for mostly you of all about tech. Uh, I think you maybe talk about this a little bit in your book um, with some of the social media platforms, but uh, how do you see technology factoring into what you laid out, that we trust people more when we think they're going to do what they say, when, they, when they're not going to do us harm? But we've necessarily sort of recently seen a lot of people in, in high positions of power and otherwise sort of not do that, not be constrained. Um, but, but here there's a little camera in the corner of the room that keeps us constrained. And we all know that, including you guys up there. You know, uh, it, 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 Does tech potentially eventually play a role that, that, that helps keep us constrained in a, in a healthy direction around trust? Well, I, I have to say, honestly, I'm inclined to say no. Um, broadly speaking, the, the evolution of information technology has been very bad for, um, for our trust in institutions and for the capacity of institutions to form trustworthy people. That is, to create people who feel constrained by their obligations to a role, to a place. Um, and, you know, I, I, I think that's in large part because what, what social media allows you to do is to place yourself as an individual on a platform. So even though you are a New York Times reporter, it's just you on Twitter. And th that encourages you to think not as a journalist, but as an individual with a, an individual following uh, and an individual brand. And you know, obviously there are advantages to that. People aren't stupid to be doing it. But from the point of view of building trust in one another, I do think it has been quite bad. And it also encourages us to, um, it, to blur the line between private and public in ways that make it hard to trust. I mean, is Twitter private or public is actually kind of a complicated question. Uh, obviously, it's public, and yet you, you're an individual. You're be, you feel like you're arguing with one person, even though anyone who cares to watch is watching. And it makes it very hard to know what your role is supposed to be. Am I functioning here as part of a larger institutional structure or am I here as an individual uh, with my own personal following? And I think a lot of people with real authority in various institutions at, at the, from the local level to the national in American life have found it difficult to uh, translate the language of institutional restraint to social media. Now, we could get better at it over time. We tend to get better at things over time, uh, and we're still new to social media. But I think for the time being, it's been quite bad for the sort of trust that I uh, started with. Okay, we're going to end on that note. Um, please uh, join me in thanking the panelists. It's a great conversation. And we'll take a five-minute break, and then we've got one more panel, and there's alcohol at the end of it. So stick around.
drop a new unaffiliated member. Like, there was definitely a I wish the few people would, would tip me when they're going to drop a new like a oh, poll um, because I get also to get all these calls and I'm like I needed to have my schedule blocked today yeah, yeah, because yeah. I got four calls today about this poll. All right, Kevin. All right, let's uh, get this panel started. I almost said let's get this party started, but that seems that seems wrong somehow. Um, we are going to be talking about religion and social, social capital in this session, which uh, seems appropriate since if I remember correctly, and I'm sure one of these fellows will correct me if I'm wrong, that religion etymologically has to do with binding us together. Um, it would have something to do with social capital. We've got an all-star team um, that uh, is going to kick things off here. We're going to start with my AEI colleague, Tim Carney, who has been a writer for a long time with the Washington Examiner and is the author of a few books, most recently Alienated America, um, which touches on these themes quite extensively. Let's get us started. Thanks, Ramesh. Yes, uh, there's copies outside. You'll see it's the one with the uh, collapsing, dilapidated church on the front. That's Alienated America. And it was kind of a, a How Trump Happened book, and I deliberately did not put a collapsing, dilapidated factory on the front because I thought our, our social woes, and yes, I'm counting Donald Trump as one of our social woes, are rooted in the collapse of civil society, what the first panel was on, and the single most important institution of civil society in American history is the church, broadly understood. And so uh, the deinstitutionalization, particularly of the working class and the middle class, is the source of our deaths of despair. It's the source of our political um, rancor. It's the source of the collapse in marriage and in family formation. And the, the most important example of deinstitutionalization is our retreat from church, which isn't the same. Sometimes I mistakenly say secularization, but religiosity and attendance are two different things. And everybody who studies this will tell you that religiosity, its, um, it's correlation with positive social outcomes is entirely dependent on, and I might be overstating a little, but basically attendance is what correlates with good outcomes. So when Robert Putnam wrote Bowling Alone, he had one chapter on religion in which he said 50% of all civic activity originates in the church. I, I would have thought that would have deserved more than one chapter, but sure enough, he followed it up with a much larger book uh, written with, um, was it David Campbell? David Campbell, David Campbell uh, at Notre Dame and uh, called American Grace. It's twice the thickness of, of Bowling Alone. And it's all about the correlations between religious attendance, basically, and good outcomes, good civic institutions. So if we talk about the collapse of civil society in America, we're talking about the collapse of church. And that sounds crazy to almost the entire news media, who, especially 15 years ago, a lot of people on the left predicted, oh, the secularization of America, it's gonna be good, we'll get rid of the religious right. And then you imagine somebody like falling asleep thinking that in 2006 in the offices of the New Republic, and then they wake up on inauguration day in 2017, or better yet, on January 6th, uh, 2021. And that's when I was interviewing people here near the White House, walking with them towards the Capitol. I had no idea what was going on in the Capitol, but I asked everybody I met that day a question that I didn't think any other reporter would ask, which is, where do you go to church? Every single person I talked to said, well, I'm very religious, but I, I sort of do my own research. <laughs> and um, so the, the QAnon and deinstitutionalized church story I think is important. I'm particularly bringing that up because it's a place where um, Dan and Ryan have done research that at least has tension with, with my theory on Trumpism and, and the deinstitutionalized church. But I'll, I'm just gonna wrap it up with a forward look at my, the next book I'm writing. It's kind of inspired by the fact that millennials aren't having babies. And a lot of the research there shows that of all the things that predict who's going to have kids, being richer, having more money, having higher income doesn't really correlate with uh, having more kids. Being more religious does. Living in a place where people go to church, synagogue, mosque, correlates with it. And the best example is outside of the US is Israel. The wealthy, the only wealthy country that's significantly above replacement rate is Israel at 3.0 babies 
per woman of childbearing age. Europe is basically at about 1.5. The United States is about 1.6, 1.7. Israel has a middle of the road welfare state. They have extraordinary levels of education, very uh, high levels of wealth compared to the rest of the world, and yet they have 3.0 babies per woman of childbearing age. And it's not all the Orthodox with their you know, eight, nine kids. Secular Jews in Israel average 2.0 babies. Americans as a whole average 1.6. Secular Americans, I don't know what it is. It's probably about 1.0. So this is why religion is important even beyond attendance, which I was emphasizing earlier. It just spreads. Pregnancy, it turns out, it's like COVID, it's contagious, it spreads in the air. Because religion, one of the things it does is it creates a culture that's pro-family, that's pro-kid, and then you get the social infrastructure that welcomes people raising families. So that's my case for why our problems from Trump to our baby bus are rooted in the collapse of religion and mostly the collapse in religious attendance. All right, we are going to have to supplement your biology instruction, apparently. <laughs> Uh, but uh, that we'll save that for another time. Um, Ryan Burge is a professor at Eastern Illinois University, the author of books about the nuns and about myths about religion in our country, but I know him mostly, I'm sorry to say from Twitter, uh, but I do learn a lot, uh, even, uh, even reading you in that form, and I'm curious what you have to say about our topic. I just started a stub stack. You all follow that, I guess, uh, trying to get off the Elon Musk Twitter machine a bit. Just to supplement Tim, what Tim said, if you look at atheists and you look at the question is, are you the parent or guardian of someone under the age of 18 years old? And you look at it by age, there's no age when a majority of atheists are parents. Even like in their late 30s, the majority of atheists are not parents to children. So we can basically infer from that that less than half of atheists in America today are going to have children ever. Um, for Latter-day Saints, it's 68% amongst 38-year-olds. So there's dramatic differences in fertility. Um, I wanted to talk about, you know, we talk about religion in terms of behavior, belief, and belonging, the three Bs of religion. And I think that my very first thing I ever published was about tolerance, political tolerance, back 10 years ago. When tolerance is just putting up with people who you disagree with, not liking them, right, or wanting to like go to dinner with them, but like, should you exist as an American, right? Should an atheist be able to teach in the local high school? Should a communist be able to have a book in the local library? And what I found was that people who believe the Bible is literally true have much level, lower levels of tolerance. But people who went to church every week are much more tolerant. And I think there's this thing about religion that we have to understand is the belief piece oftentimes drives things that we don't think are that good, but the belonging and behavior, the behavior piece specifically is the one that I think is the most important and the one that's fallen the most over the last 50 years. Now over 40% of Americans say they never attend religious services. I mean, that's a huge chunk. And amongst Gen Z, it's over 50% now. So, you know, if you start looking at the data, what we're seeing is that religion has become a totem, to use a Durkheim term, become a totem or a, a tribal marker, a cultural, a political, a social marker. And it really has nothing to do with theology, whether it be Muhammad or Buddha or Jesus or, or Moses or whatever. They really don't have... The thing that's going to go on my tombstone is an op-ed I wrote for the New York Times about evangelical becoming a political term now, not a theological term. In 2008... 16% of evangelicals reported going to religious services never or seldom. And in 2022, it's 27% of self-identified evangelicals say they attend church never or seldom. And 40% attend yearly or less. You know, so, so what is that, right? Like, why are they saying, and we're seeing, and people, when I tell them this, they lose their minds. We're seeing the rise of self-identified evangelical Muslims and Latter-day Saints and Catholics and Jews. And if you look at the data consistently, what you see is it's not survey error. What you see is it's almost always Republicans are more likely to self-identify as evangelicals. Republican Jews are more likely to self-identify as evangelicals. Republican Muslims are more likely to self-identify as evangelicals because they like what the word means from a cultural perspective. And from a social science perspective, that's absolutely terrifying because it's tribalism. Right? It's saying, like, I'm an evangelical, but you get none of the benefits of the religious experience from that. Just saying you're evangelical means nothing. Right? Evangelical is supposed to be a community of people who join together several times a week to do good for themselves in the community. You don't get that with 40% of evangelicals don't do that consistently anymore. 
I'll give you another statistic. Amongst Democrats who seldom or never attend church, about 10% say religion's very important to them. It was 10% in 2008. It was 10% in 2022, which makes sense, right? You don't go to church. It's not important to you. Amongst Republicans in 2008, amongst those who never or seldom attend, 15% of Republicans said religion was very important to them. Today, it's almost 30% of Republicans who say religion's very important who never or seldom attend church. So what is that, right? They like what, the, what religion means from a cultural, tribal position, and yet they're missing out on all the good things that religion provides from a day-to-day thing. If you look at the research, and I, I got to toss I'm the research director for Faith Counts. My job is to show people all the good things that religion does, and there's tons out there. I'll give you one right now. There's a great piece published about 10 years ago called The Resourceful Believer by my friend Paul Jupe. He found that people who go to church are better at fundraising and organizing events and meetings than people who don't go to church. Why? Because you learn how to do that stuff in the church. I mean, there's, there's something that happens when you're with these people. And to go back to Putnam, we build bridges with people in the church, right? It creates a, 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 a safety net for us. It creates people in the 1980s. If you went to an evangelical, a mainline, or a Catholic church in America, you would be just as likely to sit next to a Republican as you would be to a Democrat. And that built tremendous bonds across the political spectrum because it's really hard to hate someone when you sit next to them in the pew every Sunday, right? You might vote for someone I don't like, but I don't think you're a bad person. And now two things have happened. A, the churches have become homogenized, right? If you look at white evangelicalism, it's 80% Republican now. The mainline, the people actually go are actually pretty liberal. There's not a lot of room for moderates or or conservatives in those ranks. And the Catholic Church has become increasingly conservative over time as well, especially amongst mass attenders. So now you you can't go to a church where you get a diversity of opinions, which is bad. And so now what we do is we infer the worst about the other group and then don't like that part, right? We don't know them, so we infer they're bad people. Religion used to be the great equalizer. It used to be the great bridge builder. And now it's become nothing more than a political and cultural touchstone. And I think it's given religion a bad name, um, and it's made the whole religion and politics thing much more caustic and worse than it ever was before. And man, that's depressing. Sorry, Dan. <laughs> All right, Dan, rescue us from. Uh, Dan Cox is the um, head of the Survey Center on American Life here at AEI, uh, my colleague, and he is uh, he's he's going to tell us something cheerful. Uh, if if only. So well, or at least something true. Yeah, so, so I think uh, we've gotten off to a really good start here. And one group that I think is really worth paying attention to is this group that is sort of culturally or politically religious. And I'm actually releasing some new research next week at the American Association of Public Opinion Research, their annual conference, which is a bunch of nerdy pollsters who get together and talk about a whole variety of things. One of the things that we're going to talk about is religious non-response, the extent to which we can't even get certain religious people to respond to surveys which means they are, are, are pretty much invisible to social scientists, scientists like myself and Ryan here. And that's a huge problem for us understanding a whole variety of things. Uh, but it's this group that seems most uh, unlikely to participate in the surveys, this group who is, a, they say they're religious, it's important to them. So Tim, this would have been some of the people you talk to, uh, but don't have uh, a church or place of worship. They don't attend regularly, um, but they believe in God and, and they're um, you know, sort of self-described religious. And, and those are the folks that I think um, uh, disproportionately support Donald Trump. Um, they're, they have sort of a unique political profile. And I'm increasingly worried that we won't capture them in surveys to, to our detriment. That's actually not what I wanted to talk about. Uh, what I wanted to talk about here is trying to get underneath some of the, the trends and the data that, that Ryan actually described. I think one of the problems with the way religion is covered, uh, especially in the media, is that we tend to attribute a lot of particular behavior to the individual or the group. So millennials are not religious because they're millennials, right? And and that uh, kind of analysis is really, really superficial. It's like, oh, they'd rather uh, be at brunch eating avocado toast and spreading religion, right? That's that's because they're millennials. Um, And it doesn't pay any attention to the fact that, that their formative experiences are incredibly different than Xers, than baby boomers in the silent generation. They were raised in really, really different religious households. Uh, and that, uh, more than anything else, is, a, is contributing to their much lower levels of religiosity, of religious attendance, 
Um, it's this sort of form formative experience. The, their process of religious socialization was really, really different. And that's what's really led them, millennials and now Gen Zers, to where they are now. And there's a couple of reasons that we know that this is somewhat structural and not about sort of the personal predilections or preferences of, of this uh, cohort. Um, so I'll mention a, uh, a couple here. So first, uh, your formative religious background, so what you grew up as, is still the strongest predictor as what you are as an adult. So your formative religiosity, what you, what you, whether you're Catholic, whether you're an evangelical Christian, Hindu, Buddhist, um, if you were raised in those traditions, you are much, much more likely uh, to be that as an adult. Uh, the second is that when you ask people in open-ended questions, people who left religion, well, what is the reason that you left? You just, you know, in open-end, you can say anything you want. You get an awful lot of general comments. You don't get a lot of specificity. So it wasn't any particular moment uh, or incident or event. It's like, oh, I, I sort of drifted away. I'm not that religious anymore because I'm, I'm just not. And that suggests a structural rather than a, a personal explanation. The second is when this is happening. So uh, for the baby boom generation, they were far more likely to leave, if they did leave, um, in their adult years. So after they turned 18, whether they went off to college or got a job, um, that was when these folks were leaving. Uh, if you look at millennials and Gen Z, uh, it's the reverse. The majority of those folks who, who end up leaving do so before their 18th birthday. It's about one in four, actually, Gen Zers leave before they turn 12. So this is happening really, really early on, and it's happening primarily when they're uh, being raised in, in their parents' household. Uh, so that's two. The third is that when you actually ask people about their formative religious experiences, how often did you attend religious services growing up? How often did you participate in religious education programs like Sunday school? Uh, did you do scripture readings or did you pray with your family? Uh, these questions that aren't asked an awful lot. Uh, and you find really distinctive generational patterns. So among baby boomers, the majority uh, participated in most of those types of activities. If you look at millennials and now Gen Z, they're far less likely to have done so. Uh, and so this all makes some kind of sense. When you think about, well, who's most likely to, to leave? It's the people with less robust religious attachments in the, in the first place. So these are the people that, that quote unquote drifted away. It wasn't, again, a seminal moment in their lives where they said, wow, I had a really negative experience, uh, or it was about politics or uh, gay marriage. Uh, although not, it's not those things that are not important, but these structural factors that are often invisible uh, are playing a really, really important role in orienting the future religious behavior um, of these generations. And how does this fit into to social capital? I, I had a lot of responses to, to what you both said, but I'll, 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 I'll mention this. So uh, education is far more correlated with formative religious experiences today than it was a generation ago. Um, and this is something that Putnam's written about, uh, I think both in Bowling Loan and, and My Kids, uh, which is more recent uh, sort of updated uh, work on. Our kids? Oh, our kids, sorry. <laughs> Um, and if you look at what, so Putnam finds this, but if you look at the data too, uh, some recent surveys, uh, baby boomers and uh, millennials, if you look at the working class, those two groups, there's a huge difference between those groups in terms of how they were raised, how often they participate in religious services, how often they uh, uh, you know, participated in prayer at home or attended religious uh, functions. Uh, if you look at the people raised in sort of college-educated uh, uh, households, there's not that much difference between boomers and millennials in terms of their religiosity. Uh, in fact, one of the really interesting things is that if you look at the, just the percentage of people who are leaving, uh, there's not a huge difference between boomers and millennials. One of the biggest differences is that millennials are far less likely to be raised uh, uh, not being religious. And so that is really where you're seeing the largest differences here. All right, thank you. Um, I wanted to pick up on this thread about um, religious attendance providing the kinds of social capital benefits we've been talking about. And we were talking about people who describe themselves as evangelical but don't go to church very often. Uh, I'm wondering about the people who describe themselves as nuns, uh, as, of not having religion. Are, are they building other forms of social capital to make up for what is missing with religion? I'll start. Um, if they have a college degree, yes. If they don't, no. 
so what's happening is that a lot of American social life is becoming stratif stratified by education. So if you look at people with a, a college, so a four-year college degree, they're far more likely to build social capital through commercial spaces. They, they will um, have a you know, quote-unquote third place, like a coffee shop, or they'll, they'll visit public parks, they'll go out to restaurants. They are more active in their communities than those without uh, a college degree. Even if they're secular or religious, they're, they have lower levels of sociability and civic engagement than college-educated religious folks, but they still have relatively uh, higher levels of, of um, social and, and civic engagement than others. So they, they, they are sort of, um, instead of the, the social and civic benefits they would get from religion, they are using these sort of commercial spaces and places to kind of augment um, uh, a social and civic presence. And on family, that's uh, uh, poverty. Uh, one of the, there, again, there's a reporter who tweeted out yesterday, there was this big anti-Mother's Day thing on Twitter yesterday where all these, uh, you know, left of center mainstream news reporters are like, Mother's Day is the worst thing in the world. And this one mom said, uh, you spend all these years doing the hardest job in the world with no societal support and you get a brunch and a, a card and, uh, you know, a thousand likes. And I just thought, my wife has societal support because we go to church. We send our kids to Catholic schools and she lives close to her parents. And, uh, but to a college educated secular professional, societal support might mean, you know, more government subsidies or something, but it's easier to end up if you're an only child, if you follow your career to wherever it takes you, et cetera, to end up in a world where civil society to you means uh, your coffee shop. Um, so I'm not disagreeing with anything Ryan's saying at all. We live, Ramesh and I live at the overlap of those Venn diagrams. Are you in the elite of a world, an elite not in our skill set, but in that we're graduated from college? and we have a parent who graduated from college, in the elite and in tight-knit religious communities. And both of those are really valuable. And if you're not in, if you're missing from one of those two circles, it's gonna be poor. And that's what I would say. Yes, the elites have, secular elites have lots of social capital, but it's, particularly when it comes to supporting family, I think it's a lot weaker than uh, strong religious communities. You know what religious group gave the most money to candidates or campaigns in 2020? Per capita, you mean? Per, well, percentage of that religious group that gave Got the it. most. Atheists, 50% of atheists gave money to a candidate or campaign in 2020. It was 26% of white evangelicals. And if you, atheists are a little less, or like 10%, I would say atheists, or agnostics are atheist light. They're like 10% less than whatever atheists are, 10% less liberal, 10% less giving. White evangelicals, 26% of them gave money in the 2020 presidential campaign. I mean, and if you control for education and income, because, you know, obviously giving money to a candidate campaign is predicated on having money, they still give, atheists still give a much higher rate at all levels of education and income compared to the general population. I am not going to make the claim that they're replacing religion with politics. I will not say that, but they are incredibly politically engaged and involved. And if you don't believe me, go on Twitter and talk about atheists because well, you will get run over. So my question for you, Ryan and Dan, is um, that's what I see the sort of uh, the non-attending evangelicals moving towards a centralization a politicization of their attention an unplugging from local uh, civil society so they're becoming sort of the rights atheists is that fair at all i think that what you're seeing with the group that dan was just talking about he's going to talk about is the nothing in particular group which i think is the most interesting group in american politics today 23 percent of americans look at all the religious options and pick none of the above it's called nothing in particular most nuns three out of five nuns are nothing in particular they have the lowest education, they have the lowest income, and they are the least civically engaged people uh, of any religious group in America today. And they're growing faster than any other religious group in America. They're checking out of all aspects of society. Every, I mean, politics, education, they're not, get, they're not moving up the ladder. I mean, it is that, to me, like as a social scientist and a pastor, because I, pastor, I preach every Sunday, those are the most terrifying groups spiritually and societally that can possibly exist because they have, they have said, society doesn't work for me, and they're growing. And amongst um, Generation Z, the plurality is nothing in particular. One-third of Generation Z picks nothing in particular in surveys now, not Protestant, not Catholic. So, does, does this group also vote at lower levels? Or? 
the assumption is yeah, right? Because they're not engaging in civic, other civic stuff, so it sort of follows they don't engage in politics either. Yeah, and I think Ryan's point is exactly right, that there is a really important divide between sort of atheists and to a lesser extent agnostics and that nothing in particular group. But something else that's really interesting, if you look at the, the sort of political orientation and preferences of this group, is that they are much more national in scope, so particularly younger uh, secular folks, that they focus on national issues because they are, they are less connected to local institutions like a church. Um, they're dis- disproportionately less likely to be involved in other sort of civic uh, organizations. They're less likely to be married and have kids, which would connect them to like a school. Um, so a lot of their energy and interests goes online and it, it I think is fed into sort of national political debates. And the way I describe this in Alienated America's um, I think it's been said in every panel, so I need to quote Aristotle, man is a political animal, the human is a, a social animal. And um, despite, a, a lot of conservatives or libertarians worry that like, oh no, we're saying you're a busybody and you should meddle in other people's affairs. The way I put it is, we're intended, we are made not just to mind our own business, but to shape the world around us. And we are oriented towards other people. So what shape does your shaping the world around you take? Um, I talk about the fact that my old neighborhood, uh, Wheaton, Maryland, looked different from space because of my involvement with my parish, which is to say we turned the soccer field that had an overgrown infield back into a baseball field. And how did I do that? Not because I went out there with you know a hoe and a rake or whatever, but I, I talked to the pastors like, we should have a t-ball program and we should run a cookout in the outfield during it. And uh, sell the food, just run, uh, give away the food just on donations, and the t-ball will just be an excuse for everybody to get together on Friday night. Because it was, there was this weird thing Catholics do where during Lent, when we're supposed to be you know, very solemn, we all pig out at these fish fries on Friday, and then the spring comes along and it's Easter and we stop seeing each other. So I was like, we're going to continue this, we're going to play t-ball. I didn't do the infield, I talked to the pastor, he's like, you know what, he then ended up going to Catholic U and sort of uh, coercing the, the groundskeeper there, to do our infield for cheap. And we raised a little bit of money. And I got the team together because I'm able to get access to the t-ball list. So like I shaped the world around me. I changed the way my neighbors do their Friday nights. So the world looked differently because I plugged into an institution. And that was where I exercised my politics. If you're totally unplugged from those institutions, which can be the uh, nothing in particulars or the atheists or a lot of other you know, millenn- secular millennials, the, way you're going, the place you're going to try to flex that natural political muscle is going to be the only one you see, which is national politics. And that's going to lead to you getting frustrated because you don't actually have any say and the stakes are going to be much higher. So let's talk a little bit about the differences among different religious groups, um, people who are attending church. Um, which is, of course, the subject of the paper that Scott Winship and Tom Sorourke have put out. I wonder if you found any any surprises or anything sort of suggestive in that. I have to say, um, as uh, a Catholic um, as well, I was. It's, it felt right that Catholics would be very middling on this score. Catholics <laughs> not the lowest social capital, but not the highest Catholics either. don't show up in any sociological data because we're exactly average across America. It's it, and it's depressing. So, what? What what I found in the 2016 election was that the, the Mormons and the, the Dutch reform had totally different outcomes than the rest of middle America. And Dutch reform between the Christian Reformed Church and the Reformed Church of America, I guess, aren't big enough to show up in this data. Um, but the, so the two extraordinary groups uh, in this data were, again, the LDS, um, much higher social capital, uh, and of course, much better uh, life outcomes as far as marriage, uh, lower dropout, lower drug abuse, et cetera. Um, but then uh, the libs who actually go to church show up in the evangelical Lutheran church. Um, and that, uh, that uh, again, you just imagine their community base. And to go back to the Christian reform, who, again, don't show up numerically in that, what I thought was really interesting about this, because people said, why? Why would LDS and Christian reform be these extraordinary places that have higher social capital? Does it have something to do with their teachings? And I thought about it. I thought, if it comes to good works, you couldn't have two uh, theologies farther apart 
than the LDS teaching where good works actually can help you get to heaven and the, the Dutch reform who, you know, if you talk about good works at all, you get excommunicated. So I have no explanation for why those two would both end up high in the, in the social capital ratings. I'll just, the, the, I'm writing a post about Catholics right now, so I'm thinking a lot about what's going on in the Catholic Church. If you look at the share of Americans who are Catholic in the GSS, like from 1972 to today, it was like 26% in 1972. It was 23% in 2016. And I show that to all my friends, and they're like, yay, we're doing great. Okay, that's dropped from 23 to 21 in the last five years, A. B, the share of Amer uh, American Catholics who attend Mass every week went from 55% to under 25% from 1972 to 2021. Um, just a str and if you look at um, the, the share of evangelicals attending weekly, it's gone up. Mainline, gone up because a lot of the people who are still there are like the really fervent, you know, really believing ones. Catholic Mass has dropped in half over the last 50 years. And if you look at it politically, I thought it was a, a political thing, right? Like it's the Democrats who are leaving the mass because the bishops have gotten further to the right on abortion and yada, yada, yada. It's only like a three or four point difference between Democrat Catholics and Republican Catholics when, uh, when it comes to weekly mass attendance. But here's just something staggering that I think we need to think about a lot more is if you look at the last four election cycles, um, white Catholics who attend every week, their partisanship has not changed. 60% Republicans, like 35% Democrats or so. But if you look at Catholics who say they, white Catholics who never or seldom attend, they look almost exactly like weekly attending Catholics now when it comes to partisanship. We're seeing non-attending white Christians become exceedingly more Republican over the last 10 or 15 years. And they, there's almost no political partisan divide in Catholics, white Catholics now between weekly attenders and never attenders, which is, you're trying to think like, what is that? It can't be the bishops because they're not going to mass. Again, I think there's this fusion happening where to be a white, a white Christian, cultural Christian, now means you are going to be a Republican, whether you be Catholic, evangelical, or mainline. And the never attenders don't get any other influence, right? They just get the political, cultural influence and not the, the influence of the local church. What data do you have on South Asian Catholics? Gonna get some specialized but, funding on that. But uh, <laughs> I think Tim, your your point about um, members of the LDS Church, like they they in in every survey on social capital and community life, that group stands out much much higher. I mean, we can't usually parse it out to to, um, to do smaller uh, breaks than that, so we can't get the Dutch reform. But um, this group, in terms of of how active they are. Uh, in a variety of social activities outside sort of formal religious engagement, incredibly high. And on one measure, uh, I think it was higher than any others that I saw in the survey that we did, was that how often are you asked to do various things? And um, members of the LDS Church were, are asked more often to participate in a whole variety of different social and civic activities uh, than and members of any other religious or faith group. And I think there, if you're going to have like a, um, you know, a, a paragon of the importance of religiosity for social capital and civic life, that is the group that I would I would point to because you see those those correlations so strongly. And the uh, when Charles Murray's Coming Apart came out, there was a lot of people attacking it because it was written by Charles Murray. And one of the point attacks they made on it was, oh, he's trying to say that the you know secular people just don't care about their community because they don't volunteer. And so I tried to come up with a different way of telling the story. And it was about the being asked. It was about belonging to something, particularly a church. You get the look from somebody. Somebody starts walking towards you after mass and you're like, oh, I know. And, and you start walking a little faster. <laughs> and, you start, and so usually I'm hanging out, and my wife is like, come on, Tim, we got to go. This time I was like, the, the athletic director was walking right at me. And so I was like, hey, I think it's time to go. Okay. And he caught me. He's like, hey, Tim, uh, we got 12 girls signed up for Meg's basketball team. I was like, that's great. It sounds like we can have a, a Paris team. He says, yeah, we're going to need a coach. I said, you know what? I'll get back to you on Monday. I could probably come up with the name of a good coach. Uh, Meg was in kindergarten at this point. Okay. And then he says... Now, Tim, I was, I was wondering if you could coach. And I said, okay, Michael, you know I love to serve the parish. This year I'm really busy I'm, uh, working on a book. He said, what's the book about? I said, what's on the importance of community institutions? So, <laughs> so I became the kindergarten girls basketball coach for St. Andrew Apostle Parish. That's why we serve people. That's why our problem is never like nothing to do. It's because when you belong to these things, you get roped into doing this stuff, and it's good for you, and you wouldn't choose it on your own.
Yeah, just to piggyback, there's a recent article that got published in Sociology of Religion that trying to tackle the question, are secular people less inclined to volunteer than religious people? The answer is no. They just have less opportunities to actually volunteer. And so I think that's the thing. Is like, as At a baseline, we all want to get involved in stuff. It's just that church is the main way that most of us get asked to go coach kindergarten girls basketball. <laughs> and atheists don't have the athletic director tapping them on the shoulder at Sunday service. But that brings up an interesting point. Atheists, for a while, there was this big movement in America called Sunday Assembly. You guys ever heard of this before? Sunday Assembly was, was church service for atheists. And in major metropolitan areas across America, Nashville, Chicago, New York, they had church service for atheists. They sang, like, living on a prayer for their hymns, and they had, like, a TED-style talk for their sermon. And it was, like, a big national news story for, like, a year or two. Like, reporters would love to go to, like, the atheist, because it's, like, buzzy and interesting and stuff. But if you follow that story, interestingly enough, most of them failed. And it wasn't because of lack of participation. It was because they were afraid to ask people for money because it felt too much like religion. And so they didn't have money to rent the hall and pay the musicians and pay the speakers, and so they closed down. And I, you know, I say to my atheist friends, I go, I want you to join something, but you need to realize religion persisted for 4,000 years because it figured out you need to ask for money from time to time to keep the thing going. You can't kick out one leg of the stool and hope the stool still stands. So I think there's, a, there's an undergirding there. The, the secular community wants to have things, but they want to try to like recreate what we've already been doing for 4,000 years and realizing now that they can't do it without doing a lot of the things they don't want to do, like asking for money. It seems like living on a prayer is exactly what they weren't doing, <laughs> but maybe, maybe that's why they... They, they love left. 80s pop songs because a lot of them are like, you know, 50s and 60-year-old atheists who are bored and empty nesters now. Um, what do we make of the association of mainline Protestantism with high levels of social capital? I wonder whether... Uh, I mean, it's maybe a, a prejudice of mine, but growing up, I always thought of mainline Protestantism as kind of a marker of having made it in America, and that it may just, in a way, be kind of an accident that they have such high degree of of, uh, of social capital. But maybe that's wrong, and maybe the decline of mainline Protestantism is a big part of the story of the social capital problems we're having. I I mean, it's it's nice to think that the mainline Protestant is about, you know, the wasps who have the noblesse oblige, but I, in the numbers, it basically, and correct me if I'm wrong, Scott, basically looked like uh, Episcopalians weren't that different from Catholics, but it was, again, the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America that really had, and that was, if your liberal atheist friends believed in God, I think that's the closest thing it would be. I mean, I'm a mainline Protestant, I'm an American Baptist pastor. Uh, I live in the main, and my church used to be the church where all the bankers and lawyers and teachers in my community went. We were the most prestigious church uh, in town, and now we have eight people. Um, you know, the story of mainline Protestantism is it doesn't really exist anymore. 30% of Americans are mainline Protestant in 1975, and now it's 10%. The average mainline Protestant is about 62 years old today. So demography says in 20 years, most of them are going to be dead um, less than 15% of Episcopalians have children under the age of 18 at home. I mean, I could go down the list. There's more burials and baptisms in the Episcopal Church now. I think a lot, the seven sisters, there's probably might be four sisters in 20 or 30 years. I mean, it is, it is a bleak, bleak scenario. And I think the future of American uh, white Protestant Christianity in America is a bunch of non-denominational, charismatic mega churches and not much else. Well, I have a mega church question to ask that I got asked a lot about social capital and I didn't have access to the data but it felt like mega churches sh would be less effective at just sort of bringing about the good outcomes getting people involved in communities because they're mega oh I've got a good answer for that for once in my life <laughs> um, we we did a survey of non-denominational Christians could write Paul Jube and I writing a book about non-denominational Protestant Christianity I think it's the most interesting movement in American religion in the last 50 years. And so the, the, the assumption we always make is that the more you go to church, the more you're involved in other stuff. Like one, one activity drives another activity. But amongst non-denominationals, the more they're involved in their church, the less they're involved in the politics of their community. So actually, one of the working titles of the book is Bubble Church. Because like they're very involved in their bubble, and that's again the opposite of what uh, Putnam yes. and Campbell were finding. They were finding that the more you attend church, the more you volunteer for totally secular things. But you're saying that doesn't apply to. Exactly. Is is that a function, or did you guys control for distance? Like, uh, so instead of you going to your your neighborhood parish, your neighborhood church, you're driving 45 minutes, maybe to another county, 
uh, to attend with folks who aren't exactly your neighbors, but people who live in generally the same vicinity. Oh, Dan, that's a great, I got nothing for you. Um, that's a great, actually, I'll, I'll think about that's because what's going to happen is if we have fewer churches, they're going to be bigger and people are going to have to drive farther to get, uh, the idea of neighborhood church is going away now. And like in my county, we have, in my town, we have 15,000 people and, and 2,000 of them go to one church now. And I think it's only going to get worse in the future. We, yeah, we, uh, a couple years ago, um, Ryan Streeter, Sam Abrams, and myself, we worked on this big report on neighborhood amenities. So how close you live to various types of commercials and public spaces, uh, your bars, restaurants, coffee shops, libraries, parks. And we didn't ask people how often they went to these places, uh, whether they really liked them or not, whether they knew the, the hostess or the wait, wait, waitress or anything like that. What we asked was just how close you lived. And it turns out just living in close proximity to these places uh, is associated with a ton of sort of pro-social uh, and uh, civic engagement uh, outcomes that that it, it, just being near these things matters. Because of the value of serendipitous encounters, I think a huge part of it, and I was thinking about it, our last parish in Maryland, it, it was surrounded by these two modern Orthodox uh, synagogues, which meant that everybody who lived in walking distance of our church was just a modern Orthodox uh, Jew, and there were almost no parishioners who lived in walking distance, which meant we weren't often just sort of walking across the parish grounds. You didn't bump into people. I mean, that was part of why we had to go out of our way to create excuses to show up to increase the, the frequency. So there's a, actually a paper that uh, came out earlier this year that found it, precisely this, right? That the online religious experiences don't do much in terms of, you know, any, I think it was personal health, so physical health, mental health, Sociability, so th that if you tuned in every week, week, week in, week out um, to hear service or to do, you know, participate in prayer groups, it didn't matter. What mattered is actually the in-person participation. That was what is associated. And I think for precisely the reasons Tim is stating, right, that the sort of serendipitous associations and, and interactions that going to church and, and bumping to people in the parking lot after the service or, or you know, in, in the pews, and like that, I think is something that is really missing when you think about sort of how people are thinking about hybrid interactions, whether it's the workplace, whether it's church, um, and increasingly AI, right? So I think a lot of our interactions, some of the whether it's it's clerks and and uh, stores, I, are going to be with computers and machines. Um, and I wrote about this recently uh, today, in fact, and how that has the possibility of making us a lot lonelier because we're. We don't have that kind of serendipitous uh, activity. Let me tell one quick story about like that, how religion does that thing. I was in, in college. I went to a, a Methodist church that did prayers of the people. You guys know what that is, where the you kind of the pastor opens with a short prayer and then says, "Anybody have any prayer in the in the congregation?" You say like a one sentence prayer, like my aunt Susie has cancer. Could you pray with her? And the pastor says, "Lord, in your mercy." And we all say, "Hear our prayer." You know, it's lasts like two three minutes usually. Well, I was at church, and this young couple walked in the back, uh, a guy and his girlfriend, I guess, and they had a little baby. And, you know, when it got to the end of prayers for the people, this, this young man stood up and said, could you pray for me? I lost my job, and I don't know how to pay my rent. And so we said, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer, and we had the rest of the service like you typically do. And as soon as the service was over, I saw one of the older gentlemen in the church walk back to the, the young man in the back and say, if you'd like a job, you can come work for me tomorrow. And I thought, well, that's it right there. <laughs> you know, like, you want to talk about social capital, like, that's, you know what I mean? You speak a need into a, a community like that that wants to help, they're going to find ways to help you. And, and virtual church doesn't really have that kind of same serendipitous bumping into each other thing. And I think that's what we, we forget about religion is, religion right now, the, the group that's the most likely to go to religious service every Sunday, educationally, income-wise, is people with a four-year college degree who make between sixty dollars and $100,000 a year. That's that's the most. And by the way, if you go to like a, a suburban mega church, that's what you're going to see in the parking lot, right? Upper middle class white people. That's what you're going to see in most mega churches in America. And the problem is, I think it's making income inequality worse because those people understand the value, the the economic social value of church, and the nothing in particulars are missing out on that and falling through the safety net. And Brad uh, Wilcox, I remember he uh, numbers he turned out a few years ago. Um, it was that white Christians became white Christian men became less likely to show up at church after they had lost their job. <laughs> and it reminded me uh, of um, there's this horrible 
mistake I made uh, a few years ago, letting my children listen to the Christian rock station. Christian rock is not a gateway to like Bach and Mozart. It's a gateway to like Bieber and stuff like that. But the good thing about this station is that the, uh, the sort of little cutaways to the commercials, they would have these testimonials from people that kind of at first was like a little dark for my young kids. And it was like, you know, um, my wife left me because I was addicted to drugs and I was just at the lowest point in the world. And that is when Jesus lifted me up. And I realized that loving Jesus was the way I was going to save my... And every one of these was about a broken person. It was an idea of the church as a field hospital, as opposed to the church as a social club where you come when your stuff is when you have your stuff together. I'm, I don't want to show up in the pew because I, my life's kind of falling apart. That's a sign of a problem with the white church in America, if that's the way a lot of people feel. Um, we've made a few remarks here and there about the potential political effects of some of these religious trends. Uh, particularly the way that people aren't in the pews next to people with different politics. And I wonder if um, if the falling away from church attendance is something that we expect to contribute to the polarization of our politics. Um, or, you know, it's, it is interesting the extent to which the nuns have not been kind of, so to speak, organized as a, uh, as a political constituency, but you can still see them having an effect. Yeah, I think one of the interesting things that's happening and the the pandemic exacerbated this is that we are becoming more religiously polarized. So the people who are committed there there week in week out, they're still going to church and they they lasted the pandemic, right? So they either found alternative ways, um they they tuned in online and then they're they're back in. Uh while people are at the periphery, those are the folks that have fallen away. So we conducted a poll of roughly 10,000 folks. We interviewed the same people before and after, quote unquote after. Uh, it was spring 2022. And it was the people who had attended like once in a while or seldomly, those are the folks that who were most likely to say that they now never attend. And the same thing is happening nationally. So if you look at religious change, it's not distributed evenly across the US or across groups. So the religious landscape of Mississippi doesn't look all that different than it did about a decade ago. You can correct me if I'm wrong. Whereas Vermont, it's something like half the, half that state is now unaffiliated. So we're seeing this kind of divergence religiously, and that's correlated with a lot of, of cultural and political attitudes, and views on abortion, same-sex marriage, and all these things, all these really uh, you know salient cultural flashpoints. And so you have... Uh, these you know, increasingly geographic, uh, geographically, generationally divided groups in America that I think will make any kind of consensus or collaboration politically, uh, even on topics that aren't as, aren't as hot, um, difficult, I think. So I'm writing a, a book proposal right now called The Death of Polite Religion and the Future of America which basically makes this argument, right? That we talk a lot about political polarization. Ezra Klein wrote a whole book on why we're polarized. It barely talked about religion. And I think that's such an undercovered story. A lot of people in my generation, I'm 41, look around and go, why can't I be religious? Like, why can't I find a church? Like, why did my parents get to a church and I couldn't? It's because the kind of churches a lot of your parents went to don't exist anymore, right? The kind of polite religion where it's like, yeah, we believe in Jesus and hell might exist, but we're not super sure about it. But you know what we should do? Help the poor and do clothes closets and food pantries and all those kind of things. Those are the mainline churches that used to dominate American religion and now are just a sideline in American religion. And what we're going to have in the future is a whole bunch of secular people on one side and, and some religious people on the other side. And we're actually already seeing these kind of strange bedfellows in Michigan when they were talking about book bands. There were evangelicals who stood up in favor of book bands, and they were standing side by side with Muslims. And I think that's what you're going to see in the future of America. A lot of these conservative religious people who are left are going to go, well, we're not those people, and we don't agree with you, but you're closer to us than they are, so we're going to join, lock arms, Orthodox Jews and Latter-day Saints and trad Catholics and all these people are going to lock arms because they realize we're better together, and then we're going to have no one in the middle anymore who goes, yeah, you might be right, and you might be right too. And, and I think we're worse for it because of a lot of what we talked about today, the decline in social capital of that once a month attending United Methodists, those people are gone now. They're dinosaurs and they're not going to exist with my, my kids are 11 and eight. Where are they going to go? I'm, I'm terrified at the prospect of that. 
All right. Um, any questions? <laughs> microphone's, co microphone's coming to you. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Um, uh, Larry Mead from NYU. Um, this is directed to the last comment from, I'm looking at your sign here now, Ryan. 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 Yeah. And that is uh, why it is people can abandon religion and yet remain moralistic about various questions. And that is, in fact, a, a clear finding of research that I've looked at and focused on. Mm -hmm. the, the research about differences between the West and the non-West says that the two central features of Western culture are a focus on pursuing individual goals, mm -hmm. and the second feature is moralism about questions of right and wrong. Typically, people imbibe these ideas in early childhood, and their lives are spent in trying to live out the vision that they have in their heads. And the other thing they live out is these moral commitments. And it's clear that they persist even after people give up overt religious commitments. In fact, I think of religion in the West as kind of like a house which has fallen. But the basement is still usable. And the basement is the moralism. So you see a lot of rigid, often radical ideas about right and, long, right and wrong coming from people who have no religious beliefs at all. And that drives a lot of politics on both left and right. Let's see whether you agree with that. So, I mean, I'm obviously thinking about The Righteous Mind right now. Hate's great book about where moral functioning comes from and all those things. I am not a philosopher. I'm a political scientist, so take that bias for what it is. And I think what's happened is now a lot of these, these non-attending evangelicals are taking their moralistic cues from what the GOP tells them they should care about. I mean, let's take the transgender issue, right? No one talked about transgender anything five years ago. Like, it wasn't even on the radar of any sort of... And now it's become, like, drag shows have become the number one moral issue in America all of a sudden. And where does that come from? It did not come from pastors. I've never heard a, a pastor make a big deal about this. It's come from... And I don't... I, I'm not a big believer. I would argue it came from transgenderism well, coming out of nowhere. I mean, it wasn't a, it wasn't a thing. I, now it's... I get it. I get it. But what I'm saying is it's not being driven from the, the religious... It's not a religious fervor. It's almost a political fervor that took on religious overtones over time. I have never had a homily about transgenderism. Me neither. Never, not once. And I think that's what's happening is the GOP, you know, both political parties have, I'll give you a good example, okay? So two weeks ago, uh, governor of Florida, Ron DeSantis, uh, signs a six-week abortion ban, which, by the way, from a polling standpoint, is incredibly unpopular, okay? That's just a fact. But then on social media, the, the liberals respond by a uh, hashtag, shout your abortion campaign. That's not popular either? No, incredibly not popular. So you, you see what I'm saying here is like the parties are trying to drive moralistic outrage and sometimes it works. CRT is another great example. CRT was a manufactured thing. SBC actually started that, by the way. Southern Baptist Convention started that discussion in 2019. So I think what's happening is unfortunately politics is driving our what we care about moralistically more than pastors. Pa pastors don't talk about that stuff. So there was... Uh, what Yeah. is precisely because it doesn't affect the moral structure, which is actually crucial mm -hmm. to the society politically. I mean, I it's, think it, it results in a less tolerant moralism. I mean, there, that there's might actually, be true as well, but Emily, we'd be much worse off if we didn't have the moralism. That would be a disaster. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, then I, we'd be I, like Latin America. Yeah. I mean, Emily Eakins, I think, did a, a poll of just of Trump voters and like their attitudes towards gay people and immigrants and the Trump voters who went to church more in this poll um, were more, had warmer attitudes towards them. I think there's a question behind the podium that was hiding from you, so. <laughs> Thanks, uh, I'm Sean Riley with the American Conservative. So it sounds like um, uh, the, the point about atheism, the, the kind of atheist attempts to sort of do religion fail but you you said that they fail because they didn't want to ask for money but that sounds like in principle it could have been successful so is there something distinctive about religion here i mean i understand we're talking about social capital so sociological analysis of religion is makes sense but is there something distinctive about religion or the transcendent or something like that that is categorically different than other kinds of social organization that could provide this as a pastor absolutely yes we need religion forever and for always. I mean, to be honest, in every recorded religion, every recorded society you've ever had, there's religion. And I think, I mean, I don't want to go into like this, we have this God-shaped hole in us and all this kind of thing. We are social creatures who want to find a social outlet, and religion provided many of us, for most of human history, a social outlet. 
And now we've sort of gotten rid of that and we're sitting around going, what, what do we do now? Like, how do we recreate that? And I think we're going to see some stumbling, bumbling attempts to recreate it. And um, on the question of family, I mean, family is, parenthood is a, a sacrifice. Um, one way I put it is that uh, Jesus told us to feed the hungry and clothe the naked, but I wake up every morning and there are hungry, naked people in my house. So to make a sacrifice, to think a sacrifice is good and then make the sacrifice be easy, to make the yoke light, um, that doesn't sound like a good deal if, unless you think that sacrifice is good. I, for me to say it's easy for me to find other people for whom to lay down my life doesn't sound good to a totally to the average totally secular ear. So what I would say about um, Christianity in specific, because that's the one that I can talk about, is that um, we yes, it, it calls for us to do something that's irrational, which is to lay down our life, and that that's why it's going to be different from um, the average other thing. Now, are there atheists who or seculars who just basically lay down their life for their local community, the public school and the library? Yes, but I think you're going to get a lot more sort of selfish people like me coming closer to that in the context of Christianity than you will getting it in a secular setting. Uh, Ryan, you refer very passingly to the idea that uh, Catholics attending mass who were Democrats who heard an anti-abortion message, message might be driven away. Mm -hmm. To what extent is that a subset of a larger politicization of religion that drives people away and sorts people? So that's a that's a great question. And um, so I was looking at this this week. I was trying to figure out if Donald Trump drove people away from church, Donald Trump specifically. And if you look, I broke it down by birth cohorts, which are five-year windows of people being born, so like 1975 to 1979. So the two cohorts that were the most impacted by the Trump effect were people born between 1975 and 1979 and 1980 and 1984. So like older millennials, young Gen, Gen X people, which is... Everybody on the stage. Everyone on the yep. stage right now. Exactly right. So if you look at the share who said they, they never attended church, how much that changed between 2010 and 2016, it was like 2% they rose in those six years. And between 2016 and 2022, it went up 13%. So we're, I mean, and I, I mean, listen, I, I don't want to say it's all about Trump. It's all about Trump. It's all about Trump. But man, it's hard to look at that data and go, what else happened in 2016, right? There was an inflection point that happened for people like me who, who were raised in an evangelical household in the 1990s, saw Trump and went, a lot of people like me went, whoa, if that's what evangelicalism is, that is not what I'm about. And I do think, and there's, by the way, there's tons of data that even goes back to the 1990s about um, Sprague did this study in, in, uh, in, uh, around Notre Dame about Catholic parishes that were pro-life and pro-choice, and he found that people that were pro-choice went to pro-choice, more pro-choice parishes. They sorted themselves out because they, who wants to go to church and be told something they disagree with every Sunday? You did, know, we're going to go somewhere else in here and be reinforced with those views. Did 2016... Um change belief as well as attendance? I mean, I guess the glib way of putting it would, would be, did, did Trump cause people to doubt the existence of God? <laughs> <laughs> it, it did change their attitudes about whether uh, public officials who were immoral in their private life could behave ethically uh, in their public duties. So white evangelical Christians changed on that metric by like 40 points between 2011. The Old Testament has plenty of examples of very immoral. Right. Uh, the other right. thing too, uh, for white evangelical Protestants and their views of Trump, uh, I'm writing a piece now for 538 that looks at a really important educational divide. So white evangelicals with a four year degree, um, far less enamored with Trump than those without. And so that may, and they're about a quarter of all uh, white and, evangelical And so Protestants. part of the question is, are they falling out of church? Just before you were talking about uh, Northwestern Iowa, very Dutch reform. Yep. I wonder about Western Michigan, about whether sort of college educated, probably social right of center, but Republican voting, want their kids to go to college, um, uh, white evangelicals, did some of them get radicalized and become Trumpy evangelicals, and some of them moved the other way and stopped going to church and became, you know, uh, professional Democrats or whatever? I think you're, the biggest move you've seen is the low attendance, low education, 
white Christians are the one who became more Republican over the last... The, the people that were in the top right corner, so high education, high attendance, are just as Republican today as they were 15 years ago. It's the people in the bottom left corner, low education, low attendance, who became a lot more... And I do wonder if that top right corner, high education, high attendance, are actually going to go down a little bit with sort of what the GOP has become and be replaced by the low education, low attendance white Christians. All right. So um, we're... Many of us here are committed to the good news. It's just not on this panel. Uh, and I would like to thank you for uh, listening and for these great questions and thank my panelists for a great conversation. Uh, thank you all. That panel was excellent. Um, uh, yeah, never, never a dull moment in, in, in that session at all. Um, so we want to wrap up. Um, just want to thank all of the uh, panelists, uh, the moderators, uh, the keynoters um, today. Uh, I want to thank um, Jesse Wall, who's the program manager of COSM, uh, who's homesick, hopefully watching online. Um, my uh, deputy director, Kevin Corinth, um, the COSM RAs, uh, Thomas O'Rourke, Sam Owens, Hannah Mayhew, and Tim Sprunt was somewhere. There he is. Um, uh, AI events, GR comms folks, and the folks that fed us. Um, so I'm going to end with a couple of quotes, one of which I'll confess is probably a little bit long um, uh, to put the day in perspective. Um, the first one is, for, is uh, and they both tie back to AEI. So the first one's from uh, 1985. It's from Michael Novak, uh, who worked on the Social Invention Project here and was involved in the Mediating Structures Project. Um, and the quote from his, him is, in my opinion, government should do more, if not monetarily, then at least with considerable social inventiveness, and not solely in the way government has been doing it. While the moral principles we hold will not allow us to do less, not at least while the problems of the poor are so poignant, we are now called to invent a better way. For many years now, the thought has nagged me that our intellectual elites in academia, journalism, and policymaking are preoccupied with the twin modern concerns of the individual and the state. Yet in the actual social world in which most human beings live, neither our naked individuality nor our role as citizens actually predominates. Family life in particular and the smaller social worlds of our friends, associates, and neighbors have far more to do with our daily happiness, welfare, hurt, and need. Between the individual and the state, there are crucial social worlds, mediating institutions, in which we dwell as active social animals. In neglecting those crucial social worlds and in concentrating on state assistance to individuals, our public policy is seriously out of touch with human reality. Uh, so 10 years uh, after that, um, there was an AEI publication uh, that looked back on the 1977 publication of To Empower People that we've been talking about. And Peter Berger and Richard John Newhouse uh, reflected on that, uh, identifying, quote, an intellectual alienation from what might be called the everyday life of Americans. Uh, and they asked, is it possible to generate intellectual excitement about everyday lives of everyday people? We very much hope it is possible, for the alternative is an intellectual class as the permanent enemy of a people who are in a state of continuous resentment against those who presume to know better than they how they ought to live their lives. That was in 1996. Um, this stuff is important for, uh, the, for individuals' uh, uh, social lives and their problems. Um, it's stuff for our future as a country. Um, and so it's our hope that, uh, that uh, events like today and research that we'll continue to do in the future will have an impact on some of these issues. Thank you all for coming. Um, let's enjoy some fellowship of our own out here. Thank you.